And it looks like we are live on YouTube now. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Health Coverage Insurance and Financial Services um, Committee. Um, we are convened this morning for the purpose of several work sessions, um, but we are uh, going to be taking up LD 1196 first and running that work session uh, much more like a public hearing as there is um, bill text or amendment text uh, that was circulated on Friday um, and uh, which um, is new. And we want to take specific feedback uh, from um, public and stakeholders on the text uh, that was circulated of LD 1196. And maybe uh, Colleen could drop into the chat the link to that PDF um, of the amendment, if that's possible. And I'll also let folks know that you can find our committee materials um, by going to the legislature's committee information page, choosing our committee, and then clicking the committee materials button. And then you can find all of our committee materials by LD. And so we will take up LD 1196 first. Then we'll turn our attention to a work session on LD 794 and LD uh, 1266. And each of those has had amendments circulated. Um, LD 1266 was circulated on Friday as well and can be found in our committee materials. And LD 794 on amendment was circulated just about a half an hour ago, but that can also be found in our committee materials online. So, um, so just to set the stage, that's the plan of attack for today. Um, my plan with 1196 would be to um, ask folks uh, when we get to that place, uh, to that point to uh, raise their electronic hands and I'll bring folks in one by one, just as I would in a public hearing. Okay, so with that um, out of the way, I will uh, next turn to committee introductions and we will start this morning with Representative Arford. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, my name my name is Representative Poppy Arford, and I represent District 49, which is the western part of Brunswick. Representative Evans. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Evans. I represent House District 120, including the towns of Atkinson, Brownville, Dover Foxcroft, Medford Milo, Orneville Township, and Lakeview. Thank you. Representative Matheson. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Christy Matheson. I represent District 1, Kittery. Representative Blyer. Madam Chair, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Blyer. I represent District 22, which is Limington and part of Buxton, Standish, and Limerick. Representative Brooks. Good morning. My name is Heidi Brooks. I represent House District 61, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Melarano. Good morning, I'm Gina Melarano. I represent House District 62, and that's part of Auburn. Representative Morris. Good morning, I'm State Representative Joshua Morris. I represent House District 75, which is Turner, Leeds, and Livermore. Senator Brenner. Good morning. Thank you so much. My name is Stacey Brenner. I represent Senate District 30, which includes all of Gorham, part of Scarborough, and part of Buxton. And I think I got everyone. I am Heather Sanborn. I represent Senate District 28, which is half of Portland, and half of Westbrook, um, and serve as co-chair of the committee. And my co-chair, my other co-chair is in another committee at the moment and will join us later on this morning as she's able. We are assisted today as always by Colleen McCarthy-Reed, our OPLA analyst, and Edna Kayford, our committee clerk. Um, and I'll note that uh, Colleen has uh, dropped the link um, to the proposed amendment to LD 1196 into the chat uh, for this Zoom meeting so folks can find it there if they're logged into the meeting. If you're watching us uh, through YouTube or at another time, um, you can find it through our committee materials on the uh, state's website um, under LD 1196. Um, so with that, 
Um, I'm going to ask uh, those folks who have, actually, I think what I'll do first is to bring um, uh, Representative Zager into um, the meeting as a panelist. He is the sponsor of LD1196. Good morning, Representative Zager. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, very much for the further consideration of LD 1196. Excellent. So I'm going to have you hang out with us for a little bit and uh, have uh, Colleen walk the committee through the amendment. I think we'll start there. Um, and then everybody's kind of on the same page to set the stage. Okay, sure. Um, do you want me to share it or are you good with just walking people through? How are people on second screens? Can you raise your hand if you? it would be helpful for Colleen to share the amendment or whether you already have it open. Just raise your hand if you'd like her to share your physical hand. All right, we have one request to share. So why don't you go ahead and share the uh, amendment and just um, kind of summarize what each section does. Okay. Uh, let's see, here I am. Okay, so I think everybody can see this here. Um, I'll just hide this. Uh, LD 1196, as you'll recall, um, last session, the committee uh, asked uh, for the bill to be carried over and asked the Maine Medical Association to convene a stakeholder group that Representative Zager and others participated in to um, continue their discussion of the issues raised by LD 1196. And you had a report back to the committee um, at the end of January about the results of their report. And um, after that meeting directed that um, I put together a draft, uh, a met proposed amendment based on some of the recommendations of the stakeholder group, primarily focused on um, behavioral health is issues. Um, so this is the discussion draft that was shared with folks. And as Senator Sanborn said, the purpose of today's work session is to sort of get some additional public comment on the, um, the, the language and more discussion of these issues. So I separated out the, the draft into three parts. Part A um, would be um, a section of uh, the bill that would direct the um, main quality forum to do some continued or some annual reporting on uh, behavioral health care spending. And this would build on the current law, which requires the Maine Quality Forum using data from the Maine Health Data Organization to uh, develop an annual report on primary care spending in the state. And so this would add an element or a component to that um, focused on behavioral health care. So subsection, uh, section A1 um, adds, proposes a definition of what behavioral health care means, and then section A2 would be a requirement that beginning in January of 2023, the Maine Quality Forum would submit an annual report um, on behavioral health care spending, again, using date claims data from the MHDO. And it really follows along the method and the language that's already in place for primary care um, spending. Um, and it, uh, similarly to what was included in the, the legislation related to primary care spending, it would require the main quality forum to consult with other state and national agencies to determine what the best practices are or would be for um, reporting spending on behavioral health care services. Um, part B of the proposed um, amendment for your consideration makes changes to um, the health insurance code related to um, credentialing, um, the credentialing process for behavioral health care providers. It adds the same definition, um, proposed definition of what behavioral health care services would mean, um, and then um, adds two components um, to the insurance code here, um, again, related to sort of the process for credentialing and the process for submitting claims by behavioral health care providers. So in section B2, it would prohibit carriers from using a credentialing process for behavioral health care providers or providers that integrate primary care and behavioral health services 
that is separate from or more restrictive than the credentialing process used for any other help, any other provider. So it seeks to um, prohibit carriers from um, what's been described as sort of carving out or using a different credentialing process for behavioral health care providers than they would use for other, uh, other providers. And then in section B3, uh, it proposes a similar, takes a similar approach and prohibits carriers from using a process for submitting claims um, that would be separate or more restrictive than the process used for any other provider. And then the last section would relate to some recommendations made with regard to um, the main care program. So those are changes in part C, again, prohibiting a, any carve out under the main care program for behavioral health care services, um, prohibiting the department from requiring that a provider that integrates primary care services with behavioral health care services to obtain a separate license or authorization or credential as a provider of behavioral health care services as a condition of being reimbursed under the main care program, and also um, adds similar provisions related to um, the credentialing and billing process that I mentioned um, with regard to on the commercial side so that the department couldn't use a separate um, or more restrictive process for credentialing and billing than they use for other healthcare providers. So that's the proposal. And then uh, adding statutory language to under the main care provision. And then in the last section, section C2 proposes that the department would sort of speed up the process that's uh, um, they're undergoing now with regard to reviewing reimbursement rates under main care for behavioral health care services. And it would set a timeline for the end of 2022 for the department to complete its review of reimbursement rates for behavioral health care services. So that's the discussion draft that we developed and shared earlier in February and then um, redistributed on Friday as Senator Sanborn mentioned to the interested parties. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, Representative Matheson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question with Part C. Uh, maybe this isn't a question for you, Colleen, um, but I'm assuming this is associated to facilities. It's just a little confusing to me under Part 2, licensing of primary care providers. Um, is this addressing facilities that have licensed behavioral health providers and licensed primary care doctors and trying not to um, require additional licensing for both of them? My understanding is that that provision was focused on the issue of primary care practices or providers that wanna add a behavioral health component. And we heard some testimony as I understand it from the stakeholder group that there were some additional requirements or hoops that they needed to go through um, with the main care program in terms of getting um, certified, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but getting approval from the main care program for the behavioral health services that they would provide as part of that practice. So my that language would be focused more on sort of um, Providers is the statutory term that, that can mean both an individual and a, a, a facility. Um, and there it's more focused as I, I've come to believe from what the testimony you've heard um, focused on those practices or those um, facility settings. Representative Zagar, I'm gonna to turn to you and um, ask if you have uh, either comments or, or testimony to provide to the committee with regard to LD 1196 as we've um, proposed the amendment. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, I really appreciate uh, Colleen's uh, um, bill discussion there. Um, I, I don't have <clears throat> much substantive to add. Um, I wanna reserve a lot of time for, uh, for, for discussion and collaboration with the stakeholders. I will uh, mention that uh, Dr. Beth Wilson, who chaired that stakeholder group um, as a result of some other professional responsibilities could not be here today. I believe Maine Medical Association though is going to share uh, uh, the substance kind of what, what her reactions are at, at, at this point. Um, and so um, I, I would uh, defer to the chair on, on how to do that. Okay, um, thanks so much. Um, Representative Zager, 
And um, we appreciate your um, continuing to uh, stay involved in this um, important conversation. I am gonna move you back to the attendee space as is our custom on our committee. Um, and uh, next I'm gonna ask for uh, folks who are in the committee room um, and generally in favor of the discussion draft to raise their hand at this time if they wanna provide comments to the committee and I will bring folks into the room one by one. Um, I see a lot of hands going up and down. Um, so uh, first I will bring in Julie Shermer. And Ms. Shermer, just before you start, I'm gonna ask Representative Quint to introduce herself as I see she's joined us on the phone. Representative Quint, go ahead. Hello, my name is Tracy Quint. I represent House District 144, that's 17 towns in Aroostook in Northern Penobscot counties, including the town of Selvin. Good morning, everyone. One Wonderful. And I think we might not have heard from Representative. Oh, no, we did hear from Representative Brooks when she joined us as well. Okay, I think we've got everyone now. So Ms. Shermer, uh, please go ahead and uh, provide us uh, provide the committee with your comments on this draft. Great. Thank you, Senator Sanborn and members of the committee. Um, I'm Julie Shermer, and I'm a clinical social worker. I'm president elect of the National Association of Social Work Maine chapter. I've been, I've worked um, as an educator in, an, in, in one of our family medicine residency programs. I've been a consultant to healthcare organizations that want to integrate behavioral health care. And between 2016 and 2017, I was part, I led a research group that did focus groups in the six states of um, the six New England states around uh, drivers and restrainers that, that get in the way of integrated behavioral health care. And we, we had six focus groups, 120 participants of which it included legislators, patients, insurers, administrative, um, administrators of agencies and systems of behavioral health and medical systems. And did I say patients? Patients. So some of this, some of um, my comments are based, and some of the comments that you have in front of you that were sent to you today are based on, on that, as well as comments from um, psychologists, social workers, and, um, and other, and psychiatry members of our stakeholder committee. So, um, one of the things from the focus group and from our stakeholder group was really to we barriers that get in the way of behavioral health care, whether it's integrated or not, are the variable and unfair reimbursement policies and the more restrict and and the um, and the increased administrative costs that go into behavioral health and how that works out in an integrated behavioral health setting. And again, my this was 10 years ago that I that I I did consulting with a major a major organization. In order for them to hire behavioral health clinicians, they had to get actually no. In order to get um, they could in order to get equal the highest level of reimbursement for behavioral health health care, they had to get a behavioral health license. Um, which then caused a lot of a lot more paperwork, and they also had to develop a. Um, they also had to develop another set of relationships with the the seventy or plus insurance packages that they dealt with to do credentialing. So they had to like say Blue Cross Blue Shield or even Main Care. Um, they had people to do credentialing of medical providers to one department, and then they needed they would have needed to develop an entire new set of relationships and new administrative um, paperwork for behavioral health. 
So that would be the credentialing piece. You credential providers, you license the agencies. And for billing and coding, um, they would have needed to, again, with all of those 70 plus insurance insurers, they would need to develop a new language around billing and coding. coding. Um, because in medicine, you use CPT codes. In behavioral health agencies, you use, I think, what's called HRT codes. Um, and you'd also need the added, more restrictive paperwork around CAPRO pre-authorizing, pre-authorizations for your care. So, so this bill kind of addresses some of those things and some of the things from the, some of the recommendations from our focus groups. So, so the first one around um, behavioral healthcare reporting and getting a glimpse of what, what, um, what we spend, what part and where our behavioral healthcare dollars are, is one step in helping us understand what the needs are and developing a, coordin a state coordinated level on what makes sense to meet the needs of patients. Right now, we know that we are not meeting the needs. Um, the, the, um, the mental health summit, as, as in other testimony, pointed out that the behavioral health agencies are saying they've got wait lists of say 1,200 health affiliates. Mr. Mayor, yes. Ms. Sherbert, can I, can I ask you to sort of um, wrap things up and stick a little bit more closely to uh, helping the committee understand uh, how we should proceed with this um, amendment that we have in front of us? Okay, so the amendment, I, I, urge you to, um, I urge you to support this amendment with um, a couple different, um, couple different questions. Um, I think overall we need to decrease bureaucracy and the cost of administration so that we can have more clinicians on the front lines and meet the behavioral health needs of, of Mainers. So how to do that, um, streamlining credentialing is part of, um, part of section B2. Streamlining um, carve out for payment is a question three um, in part B. Um, the one major thing with the licensing, um, licensing of the primary care providers meaning the agencies um, who provide care, um, they, I would include in that um, the, right now it currently says in section C1, A2, licensing and primary care providers, uh, it says the department may not require under the main care program that a provider that integrates primary care services with behavioral health care services to obtain a separate license or authorizes a provider of behavioral health care services as a condition of reimbursement under the main care program, I would put as a condition of equivalent reimbursement to medical services under the main care program. As it, as it, so equivalent really needs to be there. Providers can bill, but they need to be able to bill at a rate that pays for their services. And um, under, I would, I would sincerely urge that under part B that talks about billing, um, it says, bill, it says a carrier um, may not use a process for submitting a claim for payment for a provider of behavioral health services that is more restrictive than the process used for any other provider. Right now under main care, you have to, you have this pre-authorization process that is archaic it creates way more paperwork. And so that equivalent, number one, um, I hope that KPRO, I would urge that KPRO be part of that and be eliminated. So those are my chief modifications, okay. equivalent and making sure that KPRO is eliminated. Okay, thank you for your input. Are there questions for Ms. Shermer? All right, seeing none, we thank you for joining us this morning. I'm gonna move you back to the attendee list and I am going to bring in um, Ms. Fulham Harris.
Good morning, Senator Sanborn, members of the committee. I'm Katie Fulham Harris from Maine Health. And thank you so much for um, taking some time to, to review this amendment. Um, I would like to, to start really with thanking uh, Representative Zager and the whole stakeholder process that we went through this summer, I think, um, and fall. It was a very good discussion and it really illustrated some of the challenges that we face um, and particularly related to combining behavioral health with primary care. Um, so, and, and as part of our vision of working together so our communities are the healthiest in America, Maine Health invests substantially in pro the provision of behavioral health services and primary care. And we have integrated behavioral health clinicians in all of our primary care and some of our specialty practices now as well. So we really support efforts to expand access um, to these foundational components. Um, and we support the goals of the proposed, uh, the proposed amendment, but I do have some questions about some of the specific language. Um, we strongly support the goal A, the, or part A, which is to have the main quality forum use the all payer claims database um, to provide, a, develop a foundation of data to support behavioral health um, and identify where dollars are spent today. Um, that being said, I, I was, um, I'm not sure there were two self-insured uh, self plans that were specifically mentioned and those related to the main education employee benefit trust um, and the state employees. I would suggest that we use the entire all payer claims database and all of the claims in it, including all claims that for self-insured employers um, or self-insured plans that are included in that database and not call out to self-insured. So I'm, I'm not sure what the intention was there, but we should use as robust a database as we possibly can um, when we're developing this, uh, this particular report. Um, the, the other components, um, sections B and C, we strongly support um, the goals related to having payers treat behavioral health in the same way that they treat all other health care. I'm not sure that um, sections B and C get us there. Um, and I would have some questions related to the sections that are amended as well as, um, as, well as some of the specific language. I, this is a very complicated area of, of um, insurance that has grown up because we have two entirely different funding streams, even at the state level, as well as federal level. And, but we do believe, Maine Health does believe that we need to move towards integrating those streams and treating behavioral health in the exact same way that we treat all other healthcare. So whether it's credentialing, prior authorization, billing and claims processing, right now they are very different. Um, and we would support making the efforts to start to require that they be um, treated in the same manner. I'm, I have questions as to whether this language quite gets us there and particularly in these um, sections. Um, but that being said, we strongly support that goal and would really welcome the opportunity to work with the committee and with Colleen to, if it's the committee's will, to make some of those changes. Um, finally, we strongly support, um, I think, section C2, uh, which is really asking the department to move as fast as possible on the rate review for main care services. So with that, um, I will be happy to answer questions. I did submit written testimony uh, to Colleen earlier today because we couldn't upload it. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Are there questions for Ms. Harris? All right, I don't see any. Thank you for um, asking or, or coming in and sharing those concerns. I think I have similar concerns with regard to whether we've got the language right here. So definitely interested to um, get more feedback on how to get that language right with regard to how to begin to integrate those two payment and credentialing flows. So um, thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna move you back to the attendee space and I'm going to bring in Mallory Shaughnessy.
Good morning, Ms. Shaughnessy. You can go ahead if you can hear me. Good morning. Go ahead. Hi, I think I made it. <laughs> There's a little bit of a delay there. <clears throat> um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So as usual, Katie um, really hit the nail on the head and made several of the points that I was going to make. Um, so I will be brief. Um, I will be submitting some written testimony when I can get it uploaded later. Um, the ditto on part A, um, being able to see where uh, behavioral health spending is going, I think will be critical in any kind of a comparative with primary care. Um, and I think that that's a great way to go. I would say the same for C2, um, uh, section C2 at the end, um, anything to be done to more rapidly review behavioral health um, rates would be most needed um, as we have a system that is deconstructing um, right now, every day before us. Um, to getting to the credentialing and the um, administrative burden, um, I would say that we don't, I think you're right, we don't quite have the language that we need. Um, I'd love to work with, uh, you know, work some more to, to get a little bit closer, uh, but the prime, the prime base needs to be that integration. So there are some behavioral health agencies that are hiring primary care as well and trying to bring them in and integrate in that direction. But they also run into this, you know, um, dual system. Um, the utilization review through Kepro um, is very different from anything else that any any other provider has to go through for main care. And I think that very much needs to be looked at. Um, and and as well as the credentialing, um, there's also a, a, an entire redundancy of audits that happen in the behavioral health realm that do not happen in the medical realm. Um, which I think is left over from prior stigma of behavioral health, mental health, substance use treatment, stigma that said, you know, maybe it's not really necessary, stigma that said we needed to limit what people got because they were making it up, it was all in their head, those kinds of things. I think that's what the root is of a lot of this differential that we have. And, you know, I think just the credentialing, the billing um, burden, the administrative burden, and the audit redundancy needs to be uh, addressed. So I will end it there and say, I'd love to help work on honing it a little bit tighter. And I thank you for, I, I thank uh, Representative Zagor for bringing this forward. That was wonderful. Um, and all of you for, you know, for this work. Um, and the, the, the group um, had very robust conversations. I think it was um, a, a, a good forum, but we need to go a little farther. Representative Brooks. <clears throat> and I'd be happy to answer any questions and I will be submitting something. Thanks, Mel. Yes, um, I had questions regarding uh, KPRO and that realm of uh, of the model that we're in now. Could you please expand on that just somewhat? I'm this. I am not hearing if somebody's saying something. Oh. Uh, I was. This is a representative. Can you, Brooks. represent um, Ms. Shaughnessy? You can't hear Ms. Representative Brooks. Can you hear me? Oh dear, I was doing fine, and then all of a sudden, I have lost. I can't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me still? Uh, okay, hold on a second. Um, let me try. Uh, let me take this back. Uh, now we've lost your microphone. I did put something in chat. Yeah, Representative Brooks, we can't use the chat in that way. So, right, sorry. Um, Ms. Shaughnessy, um, I think you've got you've got your computer fighting with your headphones. So I do, um, I do. They're going through separate processes now. <laughs> okay, it's that we can hear you again, oh, and good. it sounds like maybe you can hear me. So that's a good I, sign. I can. Yay! <laughs> okay, <laughs> perfect. Go again. <laughs> Excellent. So, Representative Brooks had <laughs> asked for you to expand a little bit on the KEPRO um, prior authorization process. And if you could say a little bit more about um, what that, why that is so different than anything in the medical realm. Again, the why, I really have to go back to the days of a lot more stigma than we have now. We still have stigma, but I think um, we've come a long way. But there's some kind of assumption that people are getting away with treatment um, for anxiety and, you know, mental health services that, you know, that old, that old adage of it's all in their head type of thing. Well, it is, but it's real <laughs> and it needs to be addressed and it's part of their body and it's part of their medical care. 
Um, and I think that a lot of the stigma comes from that those days. And so what we have is a system with Kepro where, um, as just an example, to get medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, um, people were having to get reauthorized every six months for a treatment for um, schizophrenia with medication management, schizophrenia, which is a chronic disease of severe mental illness, having to get reauthorized um, every six months. Those are the kinds of hoops that that you wouldn't have to go through for heart medication. You wouldn't have to go through for a number of other things. And that's just a, you know, a minor example. Um, and the audits on the same way, on the other side of it, there's audits from you know, CMS, there's audits from the state, there's audits from licensing, there's audits from you know, national credentialing, and it becomes a redundancy where they don't take what other ones have found into account and redo it. So again, I mean, the fleet of staff in agencies to try to address all of these different pieces is um, is eating up the 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 money from the rates and and reducing the amount of actual clinicians that do the work. I mean that's the that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Thanks, that's helpful. Uh, Representative Evans has his hand up as well. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Uh, Shaughnessy. When you refer to uh, credentialing. Just to be clear, we're talking about facility credentialing. Am I right? No, well, I think in, in this document, there's a little of both being discussed. Credentialing yeah. of individual pr practitioners and um, agencies. So it's a bit of a mix of, of it, is my understanding. What about when you say license? What do you mean when you say that? Well, licensing is definitely a, a role of the state for agencies. Uh, licensing and renewing licensure. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I think that was all um, Representative Evans had for questions. I'm going to take his hand down. Um, or if there are no other questions for Ms. Shaughnessy, I'm going to move her back to the attendee space. Thank you. And. Uh, next, I'm going to move in Mr. Henry Skinner. Good morning. Mr. Skinner, I think you can activate your uh, video if you're able to, and there you go. Please proceed. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning, uh, Madam Chairwoman and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I am Dr. Henry Skinner. I am a psychiatrist in Maine, um, resident of Yarmouth, and I represent today the Maine Association of Psychiatric Physicians. Um, very much appreciate uh, Representative Zager bringing this bill forward um, and working so diligently to uh, produce this amendment uh, related to, to streamlining the, the basic structures that pay for the delivery of mental health care in Maine. Um, the Maine Association of Psychiatric Physicians is strongly in favor of this bill, and we hope you will support it. Um, Almost all my points have been covered by uh, prior testimony this morning. Um, I would just like to reiterate and answer any further questions that people have because it is very complex about uh, authorization for mental health services through KPRO uh, that applies to licensed mental health agencies in Maine. Um, it is an onerous and redundant process, um, and mental health agencies spend a large portion of their budget hiring people to manage the pre-authorizations and utilization review process. Um, and that money ultimately comes from the taxpayers because the agencies push for uh, reimbursement that helps them cover that overhead. Um, and furthermore, the process also causes the state to pay KPRO to handle the other end of it. Um, 
So there's a KPRO is a private company. It has a well-paid CEO. It's got its own overhead uh, and so forth that the taxpayers are supporting. Um, so I think that this system could be both bureaucratically and financially much more efficient. Um, with regards to Part A, um, I do hope that the language can specify that we're really capturing an analysis of the total spend on mental health care for everything from, uh, you know, acute hospitalization, the state hospital, uh, commercial insurance payers, as well as um, self-insured uh, organizations, um, and also everything that's publicly funded through Medicare and MainCare. Um, uh, I think that's the extent of uh, my testimony, um, and I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Skinner. Are there questions for Dr. Skinner? All right, I don't see any hands up, so I am gonna move you back to the attendee space with our gratitude for you joining us today. Thank you. All right, um, I don't see any other hands up for folks who wanted to testify um, largely in support of the amendment. So I will turn to asking folks to turn to put their hands up if they'd like to speak largely in opposition to the amendment. And I say largely because I think there's multiple sections and there might be some agreement on some and not on others. And I'm bringing in uh, Catherine Pelletro from the Maine Association of Health Plans. Good morning, Ms. Pelletro. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, uh, Senator Sanborn, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Catherine Pelletro. I speak for the Maine Association of Health Plans today on this proposed draft amendment to LD 1196. Uh, we do have some specific concerns, but before I get to those, I wanted to make just a couple of uh, general comments to help with the context for our concerns and to help the committee understand a little bit more about how all this has um, developed. Um, so as you um, are aware, this amendment, you know, seems to be almost wholly removed from the original bill. The original bill sought to increase primary care and behavioral health spending, um, which frankly, we were supportive of as long as it did not raise overall healthcare costs. And that is the line that we stuck with through the entire work group process. Unbeknownst to us, at some point during the work group process, there was the development of a behavioral health provider subcommittee and they worked separately uh, and independently really in isolation um, from the rest of the members of the working group. So we were quite shocked when the report back to HCIFS ended up being primarily about that subcommittee's work, which had never been vetted through the full working group. So I want you all to uh, understand that because had we been included in that, we would have liked to have been included and perhaps we could have all had a better understanding of each other's perspectives around these issues and been able to coordinate on the development of a draft to work towards what our collective goals are, which is getting people the treatment and help that they need um, without raising overall healthcare costs. So my hope is that we can be a bit more coordinated going forward about developing language that actually fits a little bit better than the language that you're looking at now. So that's the first thing. Um, we do have specific um, challenges with the language in part B. And really, I've, I've restricted our comments um, to that section, as I think that that is the section that deals with commercial health insurance. Um, from the proponent's testimony that you've just heard, 
I, I think there's a lot of crossover in what they're saying between uh, public payers, main care, and commercial payers. And I think we've got to separate that out a little bit better. Um, for example, KPRO that just came up from several people, I, I don't even know what that is. I think that's totally related to, to main care. Um, so again, our comments are limited and we really have two uh, main comments to part B of the proposed amendment. Um, the first is to the definition of behavioral health care, which when we sat down with it, we didn't really understand. And we thought any kind of health could be uh, um, included in that. And you can see in my written testimony, some of the examples of things that uh, seem that they would be included under this broad definition that really are not behavioral health services. So, you know, for example, if someone has diabetes or uh, heart disease and is being worked with on um, exercise and nutrition, we would consider those uh, important health behaviors, but not mental health or behavioral health. Those would be provided as part of a medical benefit. Um, so there was some confusion about that. Um, we gave you another example um, on stress-related um, problems that somebody might bring into a primary care practice. Um, I mean, let's say somebody got a rash. It was a stress-related rash or their rash was exacerbated by stress. They would go into a primary care office and have that treated as a, as a medical problem. That would not be part of a behavioral health care benefit. That would be part of a primary care benefit, a regular medical benefit. Um, there's language in that definition. Um, for example, not a quote, you know, um, addressing ineffective patterns of health care utilization. What is that? What, what services are being considered there? Um, is the idea there, you know, my first impression was, oh, maybe they're trying to address the emergency room, trying to keep people out of the emergency room. Um, one of our members came back and said, well, wait a minute, are they trying to keep people out of, of their, their PCP's office or somehow reclassify um, services that somebody might be getting at their PCP's office for physical conditions. Um, so, so we didn't think that that uh, was clear or that it made sense. So we'd like to work with you or wh whoever the stakeholders are on developing a definition of behavioral health, mental health, substance abuse that, that we think makes uh, more sense and has some more clarity. And we've, we've suggested a very simple definition that we think works better than the one that is in there now. Uh, and our suggestion is services to address mental health and substance abuse conditions. So simple, straightforward, and um, does not have the same confusion around the overlap between medical and behavioral health. So that was our first concern. Um, and the second one is um, the requirement that the processes for uh, behavioral health and medical health um, not be separate. Um, and I think that the, the language in the bill um, says it cannot, that, that is separate from. Um, and our carriers were all over the place on this. Some of them have brought their mental behavioral health activities in-house and they uh, manage it within their own companies. Some of them subcontract it out and some of them move back and forth between these two. But in pretty much, maybe not all, but most cases, even when those services are brought in-house, they are not wholly integrated with medical. So there are separate departments because behavioral health and medical are different. 
There are separate departments. There may be the same um, credentialing process, but it's done by credentialing prof uh, professionals who work with behavioral health providers versus credentialing prof uh, professionals who work with medical health providers. So there is separation. So that, that language to us just cannot, cannot fly. And if we um, are invited to work a little bit further on language, we would like to try to find something um, that, works, that works better. Um, so I've, I've given you, I'm not gonna review all of my testimony for you, but I would invite you to read it at your convenience because it describes a bit more why large companies such as health insurers or take, for example, a BIW or something like that need the ability to be able to subcontract out services to be done on their behalf. Um, I will just make a couple of other comments again that maybe had we been a little bit more included in the discussion, we could have pulled apart and, and come to a better understanding about. Um, as you've all heard, and the health plans are certainly seeing, uh, mental health services are really, really needed. There's been a tremendous increase um, in the need from patients for these kinds of services, um, especially. Um, you know, as COVID has just kept going on and on. Um, so there's a recognition of that and health plans have worked to address that, albeit not always perfectly. And let me give you an example of that. As health plans have moved towards more uh, access to mental health services by a behavioral, uh, by a, via telehealth, for example, um, what we have seen, what they have seen is providers wanting to be credentialed who previously were not as interested in being credentialed. And perhaps because of the um, ability to see more patients in a telehealth environment than in an in-person environment, um, mental health providers are, are weighing it and finding that they do think it's worth um, joining a private health insurer network now where it might not have been before. So um, there has been a tremendous, um, I guess, backlog of mental health providers trying to get credentialed and into the network of the health plan. And health plans are trying to address that and they are addressing that and they're hiring people, but it has not all been timely. Uh, particularly around uh, the last, you know, one or two years. One of our plans gave me some uh, data that said that between uh, the year 2020 and 2021, their panel of behavioral health um, providers had gone up by 10%. Um, now that's particularly significant because you normally have some turnover in a panel some people retire, for example, and go off the panel. So 10% is pretty significant. Um, the other reason that these things get gummed up and slowed down is because particularly for the smaller uh, behavioral health practices, um, there is an administrative uh, component of getting credentialed and participating with plans. And it is, it is significant. So a lot of the smaller practices will contract with an, uh, an administrator to do that for them. And sometimes there's a delay in how quickly the administrator can interact with the plan and with the provider. So that's two reasons that um, providers may be experiencing more of a backlog than usual within the last couple of years. Um, the last comment that I'll make is um, around the proposed uh, research from the Main Quality Forum and the MHDO. And I would say that makes a ton of sense. Um, and I, we'd support um, Katie Fulham Harris's uh, comments about, look, if the data is available, why not use it? Use the most robust data set that you have 
and just ask MHDO to be clear about what's in and what's not. So th that makes a ton of sense. MHDO, I don't know if you're gonna hear from Karen Lee, but they've done a lot of work in the last year. They have defined uh, specific uh, rules around what kind of data they need to be able to do an analysis like this. And that is now going into effect. So for the first time, MHDO actually will be able to do that. So we're, we're quite supportive of that. Uh, I'll stop there. Welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Paltrow. Um, that's a, a helpful perspective. Um, are there questions for Ms. Paltrow? I have one, um, which is that, you know, as you are aware, our committee has been uh, very uh, concerned about the credentialing backlog um, for much of the last two years, but certainly over the last year, I would say. Um, and that it seems to present an enormous barrier to accessing care. And, and so um, it, it does strike me that we're seeing this backlog with regard to mental health professionals uh, because there's an increased demand, um, both from the provider community and the patient community. And the insurers are acting as the gatekeeper that is actually preventing those two provide that provider community and that patient community from being able to interact in a timely manner when, you know, by your own, by your own comments, um, you know, the needs of um, Mainers with regards to behavioral health care have never been higher because of the ongoing pandemic. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little bit at a, at a loss as to how to Response, which I think I'm required to do as a policymaker, to this roadblocking effect that the insurers are having, other than to simply say, you're not allowed to credential any at all anymore. Maybe we'll just take away your ability to credential for a year or two years in the mental health space, and you need to pay everybody on in network rate if they will accept it. Um, it you know, could you respond to that as a as a possibility? Um, I mean, I, you know, I'll do my best off the cuff here, but clearly there's a, there is a reason that providers need to be credentialed and um, it's for the safety of patients. Um, and it's also for, you know, the participation in um, HEDIS collection of HEDIS and quality information for health plans that they are um, required. Um, for their own licensure and practice. So there is an important reason for credentialing. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, you're right, uh, there's, there is a backlog. Um, how bad the backlog is today versus how bad it was a year ago, I think is a question I'd like to take back to my plans. Because I think there has been a recognition that things were really slowed down and they've been working to address that. So I don't know if um, that backlog is as bad. Certainly from one of my carriers, I heard that um, it, a lot of progress has been made, that they've been working to address the backlog. So I think, I think they understand that that was a problem um, and have been working on it. Um, I, I suspect it's not as bad as it was, but that is a question I would like to ask of them. Okay, we would welcome the, the response to that question in writing yeah. back to the committee. Um, and you know, I will just note that any backlog at this point, given that this is supposed to be a priority, is really pretty unacceptable, I think, to this, to this committee. Um, Representative Tepler, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I'm just turning back to Ms. Peltro and saying, um, I understood your concerns about the definition of behavioral health care that was included here. Is there an alternative definition that you can offer? Mm -hmm. Sure, it's written in my uh, testimony. We've suggested, and I quote here, something like, services to address mental health and substance abuse conditions. 
Okay. Representative Arford. Uh, yeah, just, just adding on to what has already been asked, what is the, do you even know, and if you don't know if it's possible to find out, that would be great. What is currently the estimated amount of time to process these um, uh, certification licensing of folks? And um, is this, I'm very interested in the specifics of what's being done to address that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I am too, Representative Arford. Um, I would point you to uh, existing law that actually sets up required timeframes. Now, as I said, in the backlog situation, I'm not sure those are always being met and we need to check on that. Um, and I can appreciate why the committee wants to understand more about that. But there is um, actually existing law that addresses the timetables for um, all providers which would include behavioral health providers. Um, and you can see the citation to it in my uh, testimony, um, but there is um, all credentialing decisions must be made within 180 days of receipt of a completed application. Um, and health plans, let's see, uh, a notification from the carrier within 60 days following the submission of a completed application, um, stating whether it's complete or if there's additional information that's needed. So there is, there is some existing law around um, timelines for credentialing, uh, at least for on the commercial side. I, I'm not familiar with the main care side. Yeah, it sounds like it can take eight months. Um or more to credential under the current law. So perhaps that's the, the place where we wanna address. Um, Re uh, Representative Matheson. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Paltrow. Um, I actually went to all of these stakeholder meetings and I'm actually kind of confused about your representation about the process with the behavioral health side. Um, that subgroup, was very, definitely everybody was invited to all of these stakeholder contributions. Um, it seemed to me that uh, there was significant participation there and significant uh, outreach to insurers as well. And it seemed that the report that the stakeholders put out uh, offered an opportunity for review and comment on. So I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about that representation, basically from my experience, going through the whole summer of being involved in the stakeholders. Um, so I just, I just wanna point that out. That's a bit of a surprise to me. Thank you, Representative Matheson, for raising that. Because I think perhaps my comments were misunderstood. I would agree with what you've said about the overall working group, the 1196 working group. I mean, we were included there. We even offered, I did a, uh, a presentation to them at their uh, invitation. And you will see the PowerPoint attached to their final report along with our comments on the draft. But what I was talking about is the subcommittee, the behavioral health subcommittee, whose meetings were closed. We were not included, we were not invited. Well, perhaps you were included in a way that I was not. Uh, I'm just responding to your, your head movement, but I can tell you with absolute certainty that I nor the carriers were included in any of that behavioral health subcommittee work. And I would draw the committee's attention to even in the report, there is an acknowledgement that the recommendations of the behavioral health subcommittee have not been vetted by the full committee. And that is in the final report. So I do want to just to be clear about distinguishing between the overall 1196 working group and the behavioral health subcommittee, which we were not included in. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess my reflection was that I, I believe 
it was announced multiple times in the few meetings that I attended that um, Ms. Shaughnessy would be convening this group and that anyone who wanted to participate should reach out to Ms. Shaughnessy to get the information about the meeting link. So uh, that was at least my um, understanding. And, and I didn't even attend all of the meetings, but I knew that I could have gone uh, because it was announced in those public meetings of the entire stakeholder group. So I have to I have to agree with Representative Matheson here that um, it, it feels like a mischaracterization to me. Um, it was clear that Ms. Shaughnessy was chairing that, that group and convening a group and that all who wanted to participate were welcome. So um, I regret that the insurers didn't think that meant them as well. Um, now, I would say that we did not hear it that way, neither okay. myself nor the, uh, the other carriers who participated although we didn't all attend every single meeting. So it's possible that we, we missed that public invitation. I don't know, but we did not take it that way. We felt excluded. Okay. Um, I am going to hand my virtual gavel over to uh, my co-chair, Representative uh, Tepler, um, because I need to go over to the tax committee for a few minutes. Um, and so I'm going to thank um, Ms. Pelletro for joining us and um, have Representative Tepler um, proceed um, with uh, the taking of additional comments on the bill. And I'll be back as soon as I can. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Senator Sanborn. And I wasn't here for introductions for, so for those of you who are out there, my name is Denise Tepler. I represent House District Number 54, which is all of the town of Topsom. And I am the House Chair of the committee. So um, with that, um, we were taking comments from those in um, opposition to the proposed amendment. Um, although I do see the hand of um, Ms. Probert up, um, I um, am happy to have her come in and um, talk to us about this proposed amendment. Please join us, Ms. Probert. Good morning. Can you see and hear me now? Good morning. We can. Great. It always takes a little bit longer to get out of the rabbit hole than I think it's going to. <laughs> um, good morning, Representative Tepler and members of the committee. And thanks for having me this morning. My name is Michelle Probert. I am the director for Maine Care, which is Maine's Medicaid program, which currently provides important health insurance coverage for about one in four Mainers. Uh, we will be submitting written testimony, but uh, just learned on Friday, I think, that this was happening to today, so I have not uh, been quite able to submit that yet. Um, I will note that uh, I, as well as the department, am, am very much in favor of the intent of this bill. Uh, I participated in the work session and have had conversations with Representative Zager. Um, however, I think that I share some of the concerns regarding the language uh, in the current draft amendment, um, but I am hopeful uh, that we'll be able to come through some of those concerns uh, uh, because I, I, it is not my wish to uh, oppose this bill, generally speaking. Um, I will first say that uh, the department believes that beginning to report on behavioral health care spending is a good idea. Um, we would uh, request that there that the definition of behavioral health as well as of total spending get a little bit more specific uh, in terms of what services uh, those definitions refer to. I say this because main care uh, 
covers a broader scope of behavioral health services, as well as a broader scope of overall services than um, commercial carriers, uh, as well as Medicare generally cover. And so if the intent is to do an apples and apples comparison uh, to see how percentage of spending compares, that is not going to be meaningful um, or very meaningful without further detail. Uh, I would also say that I think getting more specific about types of behavioral health care services covered would add uh, additional meaningful content to a report because then um, uh, the committee and the public could see where there are differences between services that Maine Care covers and services that other commercial payers may not be covering in the state of Maine. And we feel that that is um, a, a very important difference to note. I will say that um, generally speaking, it seems like listening to the content of the testimony today that some of the language might have come, for example, from a specific interest in uh, reducing barriers for primary care practices, for example, to provide integrated behavioral health. Uh, the department is very much in support of the provision of integrated behavioral health care. Uh, broadly speaking, though, the, the, the language in this bill is extremely broad. Um, and uh, as an example, in main care, we cover many residential services um, that are behavioral health related. Um, and uh, reading this language, it seems like this would apply to all behavioral health services, all facilities, all provider types, um, all kinds of behavioral health related credentials, uh, both at the uh, personal as well, or individual as well as agency level. Um, all licensing requirements. Uh, so it is, it is a broad brush uh, and, and we have some concerns about that. Um, it, it's the, reading the language as written, it seems that the intent is that behavioral health providers should never be treated any differently than any other providers. Um, but from a quality and safety perspective, uh, we don't think that that is necessarily appropriate. And it would seem that uh, it would, be appropriate to, for example, look a little bit more closely at the Division of Licensing and Certification under the Maine Department of Health and Human Services to see what are the licensing requirements and does the committee feel that those are appropriate in certain circumstances. Um, behavioral health, as we all know, includes substance use disorder treatment, um, oftentimes uh, with the use of controlled substances, and I think we can all agree that there are appropriate uh, extra safety precautions and practices that may be appropriate uh, for providers of those services that we would not want to go away as a result of this bill. I will also say that um, from the comments today, it seems like the language in the bill that refers to separate processes for submitting claims is really trying to get at the prior authorization process. As written though, um, I will share that we have services covered under main care where we pay through alternative payment methods um, that we believe providers have been very happy with the reduced administrative burden of those payment models, um, but they are different. It's a different payment process than our typical claims and that um, other um, healthcare providers use for claim submission and so, by the language of this bill, we would no longer be able to um, use those systems and payment models if I'm reading it correctly. And I, I don't think that that would be the intent at all. In regards to prior authorizations, uh, I will say that um, I, have, I am very supportive and have actually been having a number of conversations with my team about applying greater scrutiny to where prior authorization uh, is and may not be appropriate. And so I'm interested in conducting that review. However, it is, it is a review. It is work that needs to happen. And to say uh, in this bill that we should eliminate all prior authorizations um, regarding behavioral health within main care, um, I, I, we really need to understand what all those prior authorizations are and what they are for before we just say that they should all go away. There's been a fair amount of conversation about Kipro. I say Kipro, maybe I've been saying it wrong and <laughs> everyone else has been saying Kipro, um, but Kipro is essentially an administrative services organization 
uh, that conducts uh, a lot of work around prior authorization as well as waitlist management for the department. Um, as I said, I am certainly not opposed and have and have had conversations saying that I want to understand better where we are doing prior authorizations, why, if they're necessary, if they're adding value. Uh, I do have a few examples of functions that Keepro does play that I think gets into my earlier comment about what is the scope of behavioral health services that we're talking about here. Um, Keepro, for example, reviews um, eligibility for certain members to access um, evidence-based uh, specialty services, many of which are often not covered on the commercial side uh, that are um, often high cost and often tailored to individuals with specific diagnoses. Um, and so to say that Keepro should be eliminated um, could certainly have ramifications in terms of the quality and appropriateness of those services for the population. I will also note that Keepro, um, for example, uh, reviews assessments for children's behavioral health residential services. We want to avoid residential placement for children whenever appropriate. Um, and so we need someone to make sure that if a child is getting placed in residential treatment, that that is really um, the most appropriate uh, option that, that remains. That is an important function for the quality uh, and safety of that child that Keepro plays that I don't think that this committee would want to um, eliminate. And then I will also note that uh, unfortunately, Keepro oftentimes um, has identified services that are being billed to main care that are not coverable by main care due to state and or federal law. Um, and so that is a function that we believe um, is, is valuable as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Probert. I'm sorry, am I interrupting? Are you finished with your comments? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm finished with my comments on Keepro, but I do have a few other things to say if um, you can allow me that time, Representative Tepler. Yes, please go ahead. I think this is probably very helpful. Great, thank you. Um, so I also wanted to reference what is in Part C in terms of um, asking the department to complete its review of reimbursement rate for behavioral health services by the end of this calendar year. Um, so this does not define which services, it just says all behavioral health services. And my comment generally is that um, there are a number of services uh, that one, we are going to be and have internally kicked off rate studies for section 17, 28, and 65. And we already have legislation that is driving our need to implement new um, rates as appropriate for those services for January 1, 2023. And so that work is already underway. We already have a legislative commitment. I'm not sure that we need uh, an additional legislative commitment to finish that work. Um, I will say that there are other behavioral health services that are not scheduled for rate studies or rate review this year, and we don't think it's appropriate to do that. So for example, um, our substance use disorder residential treatment and our children's uh, residential services, we just conducted and implemented rates for those services this past November with very substantial rate increases. Um, we do not think it is necessary nor appropriate to uh, review the rates for those services as well. So I'm hoping that that uh, can, can be addressed by being more targeted rather than the blanket statement about all behavioral health services. I also wanted to um, comment that it seemed that some of the concern that I was hearing in the comments was not so much uh, due to licensing per se, but due to the concern that depending on how a provider was licensed, that could impact the amount of reimbursement that they would receive for a service. Um, I fully agree with the principle that um, we should provide, as main care, we should provide the same reimbursement for the same services, regardless of whether you fall under this policy or that policy or this licensure or that licensure. Um, this is a principle that um, uh, we recently conducted a comprehensive review of our rate system and the vendor, the third party vendor that completed that evaluation also reiterated that uh, main care and payers, generally speaking, should pay the same amount for the same services. 
So as we are conducting our rate reviews for section 17, 28, and 65 this calendar year, um, I have already asked my team to keep an eye on, are we reimbursing the same for the same services? Because that is a goal um, that makes sense. And uh, I think that uh, moving in that direction would help address some of the concerns that were stated um, earlier in testimony today. All right, I probably missed some things I wanted to touch on, uh, but I appreciate your time and, and I'm happy to take questions as well. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Probert. I think that's a very helpful analysis for this committee that is not necessarily expert in main care. Um, and um, I also want to add that, uh, or ask actually, if you think it would be useful when the um, draft of this is finalized if we uh, ask the HHS committee to review it. I do think that would be appropriate. Yes, thank you for the question. Thank you, and I see that um, Representative Evans has his hand up with a question for you, Ms. Probert. Hey, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Probert, for coming. Your information and input was very helpful. Um, I am taking away from what I heard that a main care is not reticent about expanding uh, behavioral health opportunities. Am I not correct? This beyond the services that you already provide. I would say that actually for us, it's not so much the scope of services. We already cover a broad scope of services. Um, we have been uh, expanding, for example, this spring will be uh, rolling out coverage of intensive outpatient, outpatient services. Um, we've so there has been some expansion, but um, we have been very focused on investment in behavioral health and also reviewing current coverage and policies and reimbursement to make sure that uh, they're based in sound sound principles. And just to follow up, uh, as far as um, um, prior authorization for the services that you do offer, how much of a delay is there uh, can you answer that at this point? So I would like to follow up with more specifics around that question. Um, I will say that there are some, there are a number of services where my understanding that the PA is is really kind of in place for tracking purposes and that they are, um, they are all approved. Um, that is not the case for all services, but I can get some statistics um, uh, that are more specific to different types of services uh, to inform the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, thank you, Representative Evans and Ms. Probert. Are there further questions for Ms. Probert? Uh, seeing none, um, I will ask if there is anyone else in the attendee panel who would like to comment on the draft, the new draft of. Um, LD 1196. Yes, I see Ms. Austin Fort is out there and she would like to make comments. And Ms. Probert, we will look forward to your written testimony, which will be very helpful. Good afternoon, Representative. Oh, I'm sorry, it's still morning. Good morning, Representative Tepler and members of the Insurance and Financial Services Committee. Are you able to hear me this morning? Yes, Ms. Austin Ford, please go ahead. Let's hope that my internet holds this morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to offer some comments. Um, I would echo the comments made by Ms. Pelletro and would just note that um, the proposed restrictions on having a separate process may have unintended consequences. For example, um, we have experienced issues in credentialing providers. We did experience delays due to some staffing issues, due to um, an influx of um, changes of address and changes of information due to more people working from home from COVID. 
Um, and in an attempt to address that, in addition to dedicating additional people, we also prioritized credentialing of behavioral health providers. We would no longer be able to do that under the language of this legislation. Um, so it could actually have the unintended consequences of not allowing us to devote resources when there is a need um, to be addressed. Um, and again, we have separate processes. It doesn't mean that they are higher standards, but there can be separate approval processes for medical claims and behavioral cl health claims. It's not clear whether or not those would be permitted under this language. Um, and it may be more efficient to have a third party do some of those services for us. Um, I would note that there was testimony about the burden of dealing with 70 plus insurers. And of course, as this committee knows, this legislation would only regulate the six state uh, licensed or authorized, six insurers authorized to do business in Maine. So it is not going to address um, much of the problem that was identified. Um, we do have concerns about the definition of behavioral health as being overly broad, particularly um, with respect to um, incorporating it into Title 24 and would echo the suggestion that it be defined simply as services to address mental health and substance abuse conditions, which is more in keeping um, with what is required under mental health parity, under um, essential health benefits coverage, changing the definition could change the coverage requirements and actually um, impose new mandates on carriers. Um, we would also support Ms. Probert's recommendation that for the purposes of, uh, of um, reporting on behavioral health costs, you probably need to get more specific about what types of services um, should be measured. Um, and with respect to the language that specifically calls out the state employee health plan and the Maine Education Association Benefits Trust, the state employee health plan is a self-funded plan. So it's voluntary for them to report to the Maine Health Data Organization. I believe that they do, but as this committee probably knows, the state can't compel self-funded plans to report to MHDO. So they can only report on the data that they have. Um, the, the Maine Education Association is actually a fully insured plan. So their data would be included in any data that the Maine Health Data Organization um, <clears throat> would provide. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to um, present, I'm sorry, to provide you with written comments and would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Austin Fortin. I see that Representative Matheson has a question for you. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Austin Fortin. And I, I thank Blue Cross Blue Shield with, for putting more effort towards credentialing behavioral health providers. Do you have numbers maybe for the working session on how long it takes for Blue Cross Blue Shield to actually fully credential your behavioral health providers? Um, I can I can try to get our experience. As I mentioned, we did go through a period where it was taking longer than it should have. Um, and so that's not going to be representative of the typical process, but it is probably what has happened more recently. Um, as Ms. Pelletro mentioned, under the statute, we are required to uh, make an initial determination, I believe within 60 days, and then there is an outside limit as to um, when we have to make a final decision. All set, Ms. Matheson? No, I mean, Rep. Matheson, sorry. Um, and Ms. Austin Ford, I have a quick question to follow up on um, Rep. Matheson's question. Um, do you have a current credentialing backlog for um, mental health providers? Um, I will double check on that. I believe we have caught up on mental health providers or behavioral health providers. I think we still have a little bit of a backlog um, in general, but I believe that we have addressed the situation with behavioral health, but I can take that back and bring that back to you for your next work session. Yeah, I think I, I'd like to know, and I see that Representative Brooks has a question as well. Please go ahead, Representative Brooks. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. I had a question about meeting needs going forward um, and the flexibility about, um, particularly is around the integrated model of providing care in a fluid fashion so that we can meet the needs of so many people uh, in our state. So I, um, 
if I understand the question, I think those provisions are actually in the provisions of the bill that are applicable to the Medicaid program, um, not with us, but you do raise a good point in that um, we too are trying to move toward alternative payment and payment reform um, and get away from fee for service. And so that to the extent that there is language in the bill that limits our ability to do so, that can hamper, um, for example, we try to do, um, you know, DRG or episode of care, bundled payment arrangements. Um, and so some services lend themselves to that, some don't. But to the extent we are able to implement that in a behavioral health sphere, this legislation might um, limit our ability to do so. so. I don't know if I've addressed your question or. Just one follow up with that a response is how do we get it? So uh, just having a little background um, with a trained medical professional with a overall picture um, in the medical model and treating illness as well. I, I value uh, you know, members of the healthcare team tremendously for sure. But uh, I think that one-on-one um, -on -one time with somebody very specialized trained in um, medication management or other aspects that how do we how do we kind of equivalently or equitably value that service as well? And that's a more broad question, maybe beyond the scope of this bill in front of us. So that's just something to bring back to the work session or how to how to how to work on that going forward. I'm I'm curious about. Sure. Um, and we are um, we have a program called Enhanced Personal Health Care that tries to take a more holistic view um, and um, uh, a good number of our primary care providers do participate in that, but I'd be happy to bring more um, information about that to you for the work session, if that would be helpful. Because it tries to does try to integrate the behavioral and the, and the other needs in addition to the physical um, uh, health of an individual. Um, and I have one more question, Ms. Austin for um, how would, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield suggest that we overcome the barrier that separate credentialing for facilities that offer behavioral health and physical health um, poses to integrated primary care practices. So as I understand it, the legislation was addressing a licensing issue that affected the main care program. Um, I don't know that, um, that an issue has been identified with respect to us if, um, and this is a little bit of the difficulty of not having been, a, been um, privy to the subcommittee discussions. Um, I'm not sure quite what, what the issue is, and I'm sorry if I'm, if I've misunderstood or missed it in these discussions? Uh, I believe it It has to do with some separate credentialing, but again, I, I'm not an expert and did not attend the committee meeting, so I perhaps I'm off base, um, but I do, um, I also wanted to ask you about that issue. Did you um, call um, Ms. Shaughnessy and ask her if you could be admitted to the subcommittee meetings? No, and I was not able to attend all of the um, stakeholder group meetings. Um, so I was not aware that a behavioral health committee had been formed or how to participate. I did not know about it until I saw the meeting minutes um, provided at the next stakeholder meeting. And, and at that point, you did not ask to... The meeting um, had already occurred at that point. There was only one meeting or multiple That's meetings? my understanding. But I, again, I may not, I only saw minutes from one meeting, but I'd have to go back and look to be certain. Okay. Thank you. Um, it seems there's some uncertainty around who heard what and uh, what actually happened there. Um, 
And it so may be that the process followed was different because all of the stakeholder meetings were notified and, and sent to a large interested parties distribution list. And I'm not sure that the subcommittee followed um, that same process. Um, and I'm sorry, to, to respond to your issue about separate credentialing, um, we don't have separate credentialing processes. The processes are the same for uh, like a primary care and a behavioral health care provider. There may be some differences between what's required of, for example, a psychiatrist versus a social worker because the, the scope of practice is different, but the process followed for credentialing is largely the same in terms of the application, the criteria. Thank you for that. Okay, and I see Ms. Matheson has another question. Please go ahead, Ms. Matheson. Thanks so much for letting me ask another question. Uh, so if I understand you right, Ms. Austin, for there's not, if a behavioral health practitioner is already credentialed with Blue Cross Blue Shield and then they join an integrative practice, does, does that behavioral health practitioner have to go through recredentialing? Again, because they're under a facility, I guess that's where I'm getting a little confused about the double credentialing. And I know that certainly it's a main care issue as well, but I'm just trying to parse out whether or not it is a private health insurance issue as well. So let me make sure that I understand the scenario correctly. Um, so um, a provider is already credentialed and moves to a different practice or affiliates with another practice or both perhaps. Maybe both. I guess I'm just trying to figure out whether or not behavioral health providers are having to go through multiple credentialing because they're in an integrative practice with a primary care. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if there's a speed bump there or, or we're just really simply talking about main care. Okay, I'll, I will certainly take that back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Asenfor and Ms. Math Representative Matheson for your question. Um, yeah, Ms. Rapp, I, it gets a little confusing um, in terms of addressing folks, but uh, I, at least I haven't called you Senator Asenfor today. <laughs> I, I doubt that will happen. <laughs> so, so thank you very much, Ms. Austin Ford, for your um, additional comments. And I'm looking to the attendee list to see if there is anyone else who hasn't spoken before who would like to comment on. Uh, okay, so um, Ms. Rawling Secundo would like to comment um, and we will bring her in to talk about the um, amendment to LD 1196. Okay. There she is. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Tepler and distinguished members of the committee. I'm Joanne Rowling Secunda, and I am the director of the Consumer Healthcare Division at the Bureau of Insurance. I just want to make a couple comments about the credentialing section. In particular, I want to respond to a couple things that have been brought up in this morning's um, conversation. Um, first off, I just want to say as background, uh, Rule Chapter 850 goes in depth into what is required for credentialing in order to make sure that all of the commercial carriers take the process seriously, you know, that there is the quality and the safety piece. We want to make sure that they are assuring that patients, members get the quality care that they deserve. There was a question before about how long they have. I just wanted to answer that. Uh, I want to agree with Ms. Austin Fort that they have 60 days they have, but they can take up to 180 days with notice to the provider. So just wanted to be very clear about that piece. The other thing I wanted to talk about was, is the National Committee for Quality Assurance, which is one of the accreditors for um, all of the ACA QHPs, qualified health plans across the country. 
And I've been part of the NCQA's Public Sector Advisory Committee for over a decade. Um, and a lot of the stuff in 850 and NCQA mirror each other. And one of the NCQA's um, overall uh, requirements for health plans is that the process for credentialing and recredentialing are conducted in a non-discriminatory manner, as well as being well-defined and rigorous. So the reason I'm talking about NCQA is because um, all three of Maine's on exchange plans are accredited by NCQA. Senator Sanborn threw out the idea earlier about the possibility of prohibiting credentialing for certain groups like behavioral health providers. That would be really problematic, not only with 850 the way it's written, but obviously that could be rewritten if the statute's rewritten, but that would also be very problematic for NCQA accreditation, which could potentially create problems as far as these plans being ACA accredited, ACA qualified health plans. So I just wanted to mention that very briefly. The other thing I wanted to mention briefly is there's been a lot of discussion about timeliness. Um, I would say that credentialing timeliness is part of the Bureau's market conduct exams that we are doing. We've talked a lot about that over the course of this session, so I'm not gonna go into it but I just wanted to let you know that that is a piece that we will also be looking at. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that helpful information, Ms. Rawlings. Secunda, any questions from the committee? No? Seeing none, I'm sure that our analyst will be contacting you to make sure that uh, whatever we do keeps our plans accredited. Uh, for quality assurance, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> um, okay, so next I'm looking one more time <laughs> to the attendee list to see if there is anyone else who would like to comment on the draft amendment on 1196. And, um, I don't see anyone else. I think that all of those who are concerned have had a say, and we will certainly be taking a lot of these comments into consideration um, in the final disposition of the draft. Um, and with that, I will consider a tabling motion because I do not feel this bill is ready to vote on today. Um, Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will move to table this bill. Thank you. Uh, I see a second from Representative Evans or Representative Arford. I'm not sure who got their hand up first. Sorry. All right. Um, so I have a motion and a second to table again, as we've been doing with procedural motions, please place your hand in the view um, so we can judge for unanimity and we are unanimous on the tabling motion for LD 1196. So I'm going to bring the um, work session slash public hearing on the draft to a close. Uh, and we will take a, a 40 minute lunch break, um, coming back at 1230 to finish our work um, when hopefully uh, Senator Sanborn, who's the sponsor of our two other bills, will be able to be back with us. So um, thanks everyone. And don't forget to shut off your video and your, um, your audible connection here.
Good afternoon. I am asking the HCIFS committee to please come back to their screens for the continuation of our work session today. Hope you all had a good lunch. Representative Flyer, are you there? Can you just come on screen at least for a moment if you are? All right, well, Representative Flyer is not currently with us, but I see that Senator Sanborn is. So, um, two, three, four, five, six. Senator Brenner, are you there? Ah, Representative Flyer is there trying to finish his lunch. Okay, so then I think we're good to go now in terms of the number of committee members who are present. And um, I will open a work session on LD 794, an act to maintain main system of therapeutic foster care for children through the creation of a nonprofit risk indemnification trust. And I'll turn to Colleen to talk with us about um, the amendment to the bill. Sure. Um, as Representative Tepler said, this is a bill um, at, uh, that was printed originally as a concept draft. Um, it's an act to maintain the system of therapeutic foster care for children throughout the, through the creation of a nonprofit risk indemnification trust. Um, the committee members might recall that the bill was carried over um, and by letter, the committee asked the Bureau of Insurance to convene stakeholders um, to talk about some of the issues um, raised in the concept draft and discussed at your public hearing last spring um, to try to see if there were um, potential insurance solutions for this issue that therapeutic foster care agencies were experiencing in terms of the availability and affordability of um, uh, liability insurance um, and the creation of a nonprofit risk indemnification trust was one suggested solution. The Bureau convened a stakeholder group. They met a number of times over the interim and did submit a report to the committee that you received um, electronically last week um, that really outlines their discussions, um, talks about a survey that they sent out to stakeholders to try to develop an estimate of the costs of um, establishing such a trust. Um, but ultimately the bureaus, the conclusion noted in the report is that the bureau was unable to sort of, with the assistance of the stakeholders and looking at what other states have done, identify a viable insurance solution to this issue for therapeutic foster care agencies. So, um, I think where you are is uh, Senator Sanborn, who is the sponsor of the bill, had suggested um, a proposed amendment, which I circulated this morning to committee members and interested parties, which would replace the bill with a resolve and ask for some further work by the Department of Health and Human Services to see if a uh, survey those agencies about the issues that they're facing and to see about developing potential solutions from that side of things as opposed to an insurance solution. Um, I'm happy to share the proposed draft if you'd like, um, go through it more in depth, but it would direct DHHS to um, survey um, state contracted providers of therapeutic foster care in Maine, look at other states and also try to develop some solutions and report back next year to the Health and Human Services Committee um, as it's drafted in recognition. I think that they are the proper committee of jurisdiction with regard to um, on the Department of Health and Human Services side in terms of thinking about solutions um, 
to this issue. Thank you very much, um, Ms. McCarthy Reed. Um, I assume the members of the committee have had an opportunity to take a look at the resolve. Um, or does anyone feel that we need um, Ms. McCarthy Reed to screen share it with us? Nope. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to turn to Senator Sanborn and ask her to uh, tell us about um, why she's made these changes to the bill and what her what her thinking is. Thanks, Representative Tep Tepler. <clears throat> um, so in reviewing the report, and I was also able to attend most of the work sessions that the stakeholders uh, put together, um, and it appears to me that we've really exhausted the possibilities at this point for um, creating a um, a trust or an um, insurance product um, that's going to solve this problem. And so as I see it, there's three likely outcomes here um, or three likely solutions, all of which lie in the DHHS and HHS purview rather than in this committee's jurisdiction. So as I see it, there's three potential options, maybe four, four the fourth one being don't do nothing. And this is just a cost of doing business and maybe there won't be any therapeutic foster care in Maine, but so be it. Okay, so maybe that's one option. Another option is um, that we no longer outsource the oversight of therapeutic foster families and instead uh, it's direct um, directed in-house by members of the uh, uh, department staff um, that they bring those functions in-house and no longer outsource them or use subcontractors. Um, another possibility would be that there's an overhead payment of some sort given to these agencies to allow them to afford their insurance policies. And then a third possibility would be that rates are adjusted to account for the overhead uh, costs that we're seeing. So those in my mind are the three potential outcomes here. And I feel incredibly unqualified as um, a member of the Health Coverage Insurance and Financial Services Committee um, to take steps forward on any of those three fronts. Um, and so, uh, I did discuss with Ms. Shaughnessy the possibility of just letting the bill go and um, having a new one introduced next session by someone else in the HHS committee where it most likely belongs in order to solve the problems. But we we carefully read the, the report from the Bureau of Insurance and realized that there's really a dearth of information. Um, so right now, we don't know other than for Spurwink um, how this is actually like what the financial impact has been on these agencies in any kind of real specific way. So Spurwink gave us very specific information about their umbrella policy um, increasing from $6,000 a year to over $50,000 a year in the span of a decade. And we just don't know what that looks like for other agencies and what the scope of the impact and the costs are. And so it made sense to me uh, to transform this bill into a resolve that would allow the department, that would require the department to collect that information so that we walk into the 131st legislature armed with that data of what the financial impact has been um, on a, all the agencies that provide therapeutic foster care. We talked about having the trade group themselves collect that data, um, but I'm concerned that they wouldn't be able to because of concerns about sharing non-public information um, amongst competitors, even in the nonprofit area that could lead to some antitrust concerns if a trade group engages in that kind of surveying potentially. Um, so it made more sense to use the apparatus of the state and ask DHHS to put together a simple survey that would enable them to wrap their arms around the scope of the problem in financial terms, um, and then be able to use that information to consider what the appropriate solutions might be. And none of those solutions are likely to be risk indemnification solutions. They're likely to be um, some other type of solution to deal with the increasing costs of the risk indemnification piece of this. Um, 
So that's how this resolve came about. I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. Thank you very much, Senator. Are there questions from the committee for Senator Sanborn about this resolve? Yes, Representative Matheson, please go ahead. I don't know that this is a question, it's more of a uh, uh, procedural, but also I wanted to make a comment that these therapeutic foster care services are so important <laughs> in Maine. So I, I would be very willing to make a motion to ought to pass when that's a necessary time. Okay, I think it's, um, if you wanna put a motion on the table during discussion, you, I think we could do that, but um, I think I would like to continue discussion for a little while. Um, so um, yes, Representative Morris, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually would just second uh, Representative Matheson's motion, so. Okay, so we have, um, Representative Matheson, do you want to make that a motion? And then, rep yes, okay. So we have a motion and a second on the table, um, ought to pass as amended. Um, are there any more questions or discussion? I, I will say as a comment that it is very, very expensive if we cannot provide therapeutic foster care in state for us to find out of state solutions for residential care for children. And it makes a lot more sense for families and for kids that we find in state solutions for therapeutic foster care. Um, and right now that whole industry I think is in danger because of the liability, or we don't know if it is, but that's one of our concerns. Yes, Senator Sanborn. Um, Representative Tepler, um, Molly Bogart from the department has just joined. Um, so I wanted to give her a chance to, um, to speak with the committee, um, even if perhaps what she's going to say isn't what I want to hear. Um, so I wondered if you might bring her in. Absolutely. Um, can we bring um, Molly Bogart from the Department of Health and Human Services in, please? Welcome, Ms. Bogart. Good afternoon, uh, Representative Tepler and Senator Sanborn. Um, and I am pinch hitting for uh, Director Landry, who may have joined, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. Uh, you know, we've been able to review the amendment and I think want to um, just be clear with the committee that we as an organization don't have expertise in risk indemnification and um, those needs for our providers, of course, uh, we share all of the concerns related to um, making sure that there's adequate uh, therapeutic foster care available in the state for children who are in the custody of the department. But um, if we are um, going to be looked at as experts on this, we'll need to pull in um, some, some resources to um, provide that level of expertise. Um, so just wanted to, to make that clear to the committee as you, as you proceed. Um, Happy to answer any questions or have those directed to uh, Dr. Landry, but thank you for the opportunity to, to make note. Um, thank you, Ms. Bogart. It does look like Director Landry um, just has joined us. And so um, we will ask him to join us as well. I think we can have both of you in the meeting if that's um, okay with you, Ms. Bogart. Um, I'm just, I, I, I guess my feeling about that is that I believe what the resolve does is ask you to gather information from the agencies and um, that, that provide this care. And I, I somehow don't think that is out of your um, wheelhouse. So I, I guess I'm a little confused. I don't think anybody is asking the department in this resolve to, um, to create a solution for risk indemnification per se, but rather to get gather information. So that's just. I, 
I appreciate that. The, um, the resolve itself does say the Department of Health and Human Services shall determine the risk indemnification needs of therapeutic foster care agencies and has us um, provide potential recommendations for legislation. And I think that's where we um, just want to be clear that in-house we don't have the expertise to identify those risk indemnification needs. Um, okay. Um, thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, I think it's superintendent. Is that the correct title? I'm sorry, Landry. Um, uh, if you want to um, comment on what Ms. Bogart has said in your place, that would be that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tepler and members of the committee, and thanks for the chance to to share some thoughts on this. Um, it's director for, but you know, I'll address, right. I'll answer to just about anything uh, you wish to call me. Um, I will say the the other part, there are two parts of the uh, amendment as I am aware of it from this morning. Uh, there is the first part that Ms. Bogart indicated about determining the risk indemnification needs and making recommendations. There is a second part to survey other states regarding how they handle risk indemnification. And in that case, that's another example where we would not have the expertise to um, to really even develop that survey to ask the right questions about risk indemnification methods, policies, practices, or how their respective bureaus of insurance may, uh, may handle those risk indemnification or risk indemnification trust aspects. Um, so, so while I, I share everything that Ms. Bogart shared before, we certainly participated in the work group uh, that uh, convened uh, in the fall. Um, but we do not have uh, risk indemnification expertise in the uh, in the department. Um, thank you, Director Landry. Um, and I'm going to turn to Senator Sanborn, who has a comment, I believe. Well, I, I think I have a question, actually, which is I appreciate that that concern, and and maybe the language isn't quite right, which is why I'm asking this in this setting, but I think that the real, the real question is how do other states deal with the risk um, or the cost of the risk um, for these foster care agencies, or do they not use foster care agencies? Do they do it in-house? Do they have offsetting payments that help them afford their insurance? Um, those are the types of, of questions that I'm asking it's not about the insurance itself it's about the management of the foster care program in light of what we understand to be a nationwide increase in the cost of insurance particularly in states that have eliminated their statute of limitations for sexual crimes against children so um, there's lots of all those states and I know that um, the various directors who are your um, compatriots in other states, your analog in other states would potentially be able to provide information on this topic. And I, I think our Bureau of Insurance struck out a bit and was a bit out of their depth because it, I think it's not really an insurance question. It's really an administration of health and human services question at which you and, and your department are more um, able to both collect the information and potentially come up with solutions. And I laid three out before we started the meeting, which was um, potentially taking the operations in-house. Um, second was a balloon payment or an overhead payment of some sort to the agencies to help them afford their insurance costs or changing rates, uh, reimbursement rates to account for the insurance costs. Those seem like the three most pos possible um, options based on the communications that I had during the stakeholder process. And all three of those seem like they're more in your wheelhouse than anyone else's within state government. So I, I just wanted to make sure we we're on the same page with that. Director Landry, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I would say to one piece of your, your question, Senator, is, uh, as you may be aware, we provided, we did survey the other five New England states and provided that information to the Bureau of Insurance. I don't know if that was shared with you or the other members of the, of the work group or not. 
Uh, however, I can tell you all other all the other five New England states reported verbally. It was not a formal survey, uh, but all other five New England states indicated that yes, they contract out for this service. Uh, I asked that this was an issue that any of them were hearing or were aware of. None of them indicated that it was a current issue that they were aware of as it relates to the um, the insurance costs. Although I believe it was New Hampshire who said that there was a discussion in their 2019 legislative session, but no action was taken on, on that bill. Um, and so I believe uh, I provided that in writing to the Bureau of Insurance and uh, through the work group, and I'm sure they could potentially provide that to you and the other members of the committee if they wished. So the results are asked you to cast a wider net, I guess, in asking those questions. So if you were able to undertake those questions for the New England states, um, do you feel that there is still utility in casting a wider net? Well, I believe we, we could attempt to cast a wider net. We have a very close working relationship, uh, really almost a formal working relationship with the among the six New England states. So it's very easy for us to do that. It becomes more difficult when we get out of New England. Uh, we could certainly send an email request. The, the, the question would be whether, what, what is the, I think my, my concern would be, what is the question we're asking? Because if I surveyed those same five, of my counterparts and ask them, how do you handle the risk indemnification or risk indemnification trusts, et cetera, they would say they probably don't have a clue or if they do, it would be only surface knowledge. If you're asking whether or not they contract for this service and whether or not the issue of insurance coverage or insurance costs is a current issue that they're dealing with, those are probably questions they can answer, but that's not what the resolve currently states. The resolve currently asked us to identify or to survey them about specific risk indemnification pieces in those other states. I'm assuming that would have to go out to their respective bureaus of insurance, whatever they call them in their individual states. And that is where I, I, wouldn't, I, I would be at a loss to even begin to figure out exactly who to send that survey to, because it would not be necessarily my counterparts. I'll give you just one quick example. If I got a survey from another state asking about this question uh, about risk indemnification, risk indemnification trusts, et cetera, I'm not sure I would feel like I could answer those questions uh, without getting the uh, superintendent at BOI involved, for example. So Director Landry, if the resolve were reworded to reflect the two questions that you had asked our New England neighbors, um, and we cast a broader net, do you feel more comfortable with that? If, if those were the questions that we were asking, certainly we could. I do want to set expectations in that once we get outside of New England, in general, the participation response rate uh, tends to drop pretty precipitously, um, um, just due in fact to the, the numbers of emails that probably these individuals receive. But, Yes, we could certainly send an email out to the other states as well as the, uh, the territories to ask them uh, those two questions. Uh, but that, uh, again, that's something we could do. But if it's more tailored around risk indemnification questions and the vehicles that some states may use to, to deal with those risk indemnification issues, that's where I think it, it um, goes beyond certainly my expertise. Uh, versus someone with insurance background. I would say the, the only other thing I would add is, I think we should also perhaps ask for clarity around the first question among the current, the agencies within the state of Maine. It's a small number. I'm sure we could get their response. Um, and, but again, I think that the issue would be, or what is the question that we're trying to ask from that perspective? I would think that the question we're trying to ask is have their insurance costs come to a point where they are um, making staying in business difficult. I think that's what we're, we're looking to find that out. So I'm gonna turn to Senator Sanborn who's had her hand up for a while and um, let her uh, make questions or comments at this point. Thanks, 
um, Representative Tepler. And yeah, I think we just need to reword this um, to to say to talk about insurance costs, um, their liability insurance um, coverage and costs, and difficulties in obtaining and maintaining liability insurance coverage. Um, I think that's really the core of the issue. And then I think perhaps the, the terms risk and indemnification get a little bit, they're sidetracking us um, because I think the core of the issue is really just to honestly, to obtain the ch a chart from the other seven agencies that looks just like the one that Ster Sperwink provided on page five of the Bureau's report and provide that raw information um, both to the department and to the Committee on Health and Human Services for consideration next year. Um, and, you know, that, that's a quite stunning chart. Perhaps other agencies haven't actually experienced such a um, meteoric increase in their liability premiums, and we don't have a real problem. We just had sort of a strange experience for one agency. I don't know, but that's what we're asking um, and it, it's not much more complicated than that. So I'm, I think we need to back the words down to the level of complexity of just did your premiums go up a lot or could you not even get coverage for this type of service and, um, you know, talk about any kind of color they want to put on that because I understand that some of them have had conversations with insurance brokers that indicated the reasoning behind the meteoric rise in their premiums was related to therapeutic foster care specifically. And if they ended that service, their premiums would go right back down to where they were um, recently before the rise. So um, I don't know if that helps um, Director Landry, but I, I think it does. And, and I think it addresses your concerns largely. Perhaps that would help. I have not seen the Bureau of Insurance report. Unfortunately, oh. that was not forwarded to me, uh, even though I was on the work group. So, so oh, no. perhaps that would that would help with some of this issue as well. But we would be happy to work, you know, certainly with you, Senator, on trying to craft language that falls within the expertise of DHHS versus what I would see as the expertise of of, uh, of someone with insurance uh, experience and background. Great, I'm sending you that report right now, Director Landry. I had no idea that you weren't on the distribution list than us. Ms. Bogar, have you received it as well? Uh, I'm searching my inbox. I would love a copy um, sure. of that. <laughs> sending it along right now to the both of you. And it, it you. is also, I think, posted in our committee materials, but I just sent it to you guys directly. And I think maybe you will be receiving two copies because I believe <laughs> Uh, Ms. McCarthy Reed did the same thing at the same time, um, so that that may be the case. Um, but we also have uh, Representative Brooks waiting to uh, make a comment or or, or ask. Yes, so, this motorcycle. Sorry. Um, I would uh, thank Chair Chair Tepler for recognizing and the good work that's been done to this point. I, what some things that come to mind are. Um, is this a first step? And it sounds like a first step towards um, helping with the with issues we may have. Um, some things are like, how would we um, bring this in-house down the road? And uh, I don't know if you would address that, uh, Director Landry. Yes, um, that's a, a question that uh, we have not addressed uh, in my tenure since I've been here since 2019 or May of 2019. Uh, I believe we we certainly you know could look at that. Uh, we have not addressed it uh, as I said to this point. Um, I can tell you that you know as I said before, the other five New England states also contract out for this service, uh, so we could certainly talk to them about. Uh, whether or not they recently made a change or if this is something that's been a longstanding practice. Um, but it is something that uh, I can tell you from prior experience working in uh, a few other states uh, that in other parts of the country and other states, uh, they have taken different approaches. And in fact, in some states, they have both contracted services as well as in-house services or in-house work uh, that provide the same uh, service. Um, in you know, as it relates to therapeutic foster care. 
And just a follow-up related to that, if I could, Chair Tepler. Um, the, the other thing that brings to mind is confidentiality and really holding that sacred trust for the uh, child and families affected. Uh, that is something that's important and we need to hold uh, to very uh, important as well. Um, and, I, and I'm and i curious, like, and, and this is something that is something that as a next step. Broken. The question the question has to do with um, potentially um, going back to people in that situation, uh, families in that situation, and getting follow up in the in the future. So, but that's just that's not question. relevant to the bill at hand. Sorry, I'll take a step back. Thank you, thank you. So, um, I mean, I understand your interest in it, but it's unfortunately not relevant to the resolve that Senator Sanborn has presented. All right, so um, thank you very much, uh, Director Landry and Ms. Bogart for being here with us. I think you've answered or provided the comments that we needed. Um, I am wondering whether we should go ahead and look at a vote on the motion on the floor or if we need to make further steps with language before we get to that point. So uh, Senator Sanborn. Thanks, I was gonna ask Colleen, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I think this is, we're close. We just need to tweak the words a little bit. And so I was gonna ask her as she was listening, if she had either suggestions or sort of a yeah. sense that she knows how to do it. Cause I thought she might. <laughs> well, I don't know if you wanna hear it right off the bat but I was making notes uh, on the resolve as we were um, to try to make it simpler if this might be better. Um, so that the Department of Health and Human Services shall survey state contracted providers of therapeutic foster care about their liability insurance coverage, the cost of liability insurance coverage and any difficulties in obtaining and maintaining liability insurance coverage. The department shall also survey other states about how uh, therapeutic foster care is provided in those states and any difficulties identified in, uh, and identify any difficulties associated with um, liability insurance for therapeutic foster care. Um, and then if you wanted to add a sentence about the department shall identify potential recommendations to address the cost of liability insurance for therapeutic foster care agencies in this state, then they would be required to report back in um, next session. Okay, I think that that, um, yes. I was just gonna say that sounds right to me based on the conversation we just had with Director Landry. So um, Representative Morris, um, since it was your motion, I believe, um, would you accept or was it Representative Matheson's motion? Oh, yep. I'm sorry, it was Representative Matheson's motion. Representative Matheson, would you accept that language as- um, As amended, yes. Uh, yes, okay, and Representative Morris is nodding as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that satisfies the concerns that the director presented to us. Um, and I assume that we'll see this in language review. So if we have any problems or concerns or if uh, Director Landry has any concerns after he sees the language, he can contact us before we do language review or at the time we do language review on this bill. Um, and meanwhile, I believe we can take a vote. So um, Ms. Caford, would you call the roll? Yes, thank you. Senator Sanborn. Yes. Senator Sanborn. Yes. Senator Brenner. Yes. Senator <clears throat> Brenner. Yes. Senator Stewart. Representative Tepler. Yes. Representative Tepler. Yes. Representative Arford. Yes. Representative Arford. Yes. Representative Blyer. Yes. Representative Blyer, yes. Representative Brooks? Yes. Representative Brooks? Yes. Representative Connor? Yes. Representative Connor? Yes. Representative Evans? Representative Matheson? Yes. 
Representative Matheson, yes. Representative Malareno? Yes. Representative Malareno, yes. Representative Morris? Yes. Representative Morris, yes. Representative Quinn? Ten members of the committee having voted in the affirmative and zero in the negative. So unanimous of those present and voting now. Um, I believe Rich Evans will be rejoining us before the end of our meeting today, hopefully, and hopefully he can register his vote then. Um, any other absent members can register their vote through their presiding officers. Um, through the presiding officers, sorry. Uh, so now we're going to close the hearing or the work session on LD 794 and open a work session on LD 1266 and act to improve the value of dental insurance. Um, and this is also a bill we carried over. And um, I believe that we can again turn to Ms. McCarthy Reed to tell us where we are with it. Sure. Um, as Representative Tepler said, this was a bill that was carried over. Um, uh, the original bill um, proposed to require um, dental insurance plans to meet minimum loss ratio requirements, similar to um, what's required for uh, uh, health plans related to medical loss ratios. Um, the bill was carried over to allow the sponsor to have additional time to work with stakeholders on the issues that were raised um, during your discussions last spring. Um, the bill was carried over. Um, and I think Senator Sanborn could sort of update you on any discussions with the stakeholders. But my understanding is that um, the proposed amendment that was shared and distributed um, last week with you represents sort of a consensus proposal. Um, of some of the stakeholders that she met with, which would replace the original bill with um, a reporting requirement um, by dental plans to the Bureau of Insurance related to uh, dental loss ratio would also require the Bureau of Insurance to um, develop or aggregate those dental loss ratio reports from individual um, carriers by market segment and then calculate an average dental loss ratio for each market segment, um, publish that data, and then identify those plans that are sort of outliers from um, that those averages. And it does provide authority for the superintendent to conduct a further review of those outliers and require some, uh, uh, give the superintendent of insurance authority to require those carriers to submit a, remedi a remediation plan um, that could include um, revising their rates or modifying benefits. Um, so that's the proposal that was shared with you. I'm happy to pull it up and um, provide uh, a copy of the document um, on the screen if that's helpful. Um, I didn't know if Senator Samuel wanted to say anything first, but I'm happy to do whatever, whatever works best for the committee. Um, let's ask Senator Sanborn to weigh in, and then if anyone on the committee um, wants to see the document on the screen, uh, please uh, so indicate to me, and um, we'll ask Colleen to pull it up. Go ahead, uh, Senator Sanborn. Thanks, Representative Tepler. Yeah, I just wanted to let the committee know sort of the context and the backstory a little bit of what's happened since we had our public hearing last year and how this draft that's before us today came into existence. Um, so um, this is a bill that I have been working on um, with uh, Dr. John Jonathan Schenken, um, who is a, was a local dentist um, in the Augusta area and had worked really closely with me and with this committee on the good work that we did in the 129th legislature to eliminate, eliminate waiting periods in pediatric dental insurance. And um, we were both very, very proud of the work that we did together on that and had um, started our conversations about this bill um, while we were doing that work together. And um, 
sadly, uh, we lost Jonathan this summer. And um, one of the very last things he was thinking about and, and emailing me about before he died was this bill, 1266. So I'm extremely uh, committed to making sure that we um, do good policy work um, that Dr. Schenken would be very proud of us for in this committee with this bill as a vehicle in his memory. Um, I met with stakeholders uh, over the summer and throughout this fall and winter um, about this bill. I met with the governor's office and others about it as well. And um, what I really wanted to make sure we did as a committee was to do something more than just disclosure. I want to do more than just report on the things insurance companies are doing. I want to actually put levers in place to make sure that it, that they can be made better and that the reports and the information that we gather can be acted upon. And I think that's what this draft does. Um, it is a draft that came from the insurers um, originally as sort of a, a, a concept proposal and a discussion um, after um, much discussion uh, with them about what was very important to me, um, as I said, more than just disclosure. So I wanna thank um, the folks um, who work in dental insurance um, for listening to me and taking me seriously and understanding the importance of taking a step forward. It's not everything that I would have wanted out of 1266. Um, but it is an important step forward in giving our superintendent of insurance additional tools to use to ensure that dental plans have more value in Maine than they have today. Um, and certainly than some of the outlier plans have, um, have had over time in various states. Um, so that's the context here of that draft. I do think that there's largely consensus around um, around it, although there may be some uh, questions about specific um, provisions in the language that we may want to pull apart as a committee in order to make sure we've gotten the words just right. And um, I, I encourage the committee to ask more questions about the parts of the um, draft that they may not fully understand or that might not be the right words, um, because I think what we've got here is pretty close to right. Um, but not necessarily um, perfect. And it's come together fairly quickly over the last two weeks. So I haven't had a chance to really wordsmith it with a large group of people giving input on the final language. Um, so I guess that's the context here. And um, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for, again, for all of the folks who have um, worked diligently, I think in the best interest of Mainers to come up with a policy solution here that we can implement and that can be set into law. Representative Morris. Please uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I think my only um, question is the last sentence on paragraph on number seven in section one um, dealing with uh, the rule um, is, I, I guess it's sort of figuring out the, is the intent is the thought there that eventually we would have potentially a um, after after collecting some of this data, having them set a a minimum loss ratio, um, and even in, in which I'm not expressly opposed to, but it's just how is that is it going to be? Is the intent to have that be the average of all their plans, or can they set it where you know? where they want. Um, I, I guess that's my question. Just what's the intent? <laughs> Go ahead, Senator Sanborn, uh, if you ha can answer Representative Morris. Yeah, so I think that that provision came from some pushback um, from me and some discussions that we had with regard to kind of a race to the bottom. And what if the outcome yeah. of this outlier identification is that the average um, dental loss ratio creeps down over time? Because yep. the original bill would have set a floor. And um, 
I, I didn't want to give up on that idea of a floor. Um, but I also understood that maybe I didn't know what number the floor should be today. Um, and so, because we don't have very good data reporting from past years yet. So what I thought was actually really great about the way they, that this proposal came together is that it doesn't set a floor to begin with, and it would never set a floor if there isn't a, a diminution of, of diminishment of that dental loss ratio. If the if instead additional transparency and competition actually makes plans more valuable on its own, yeah. um, and th then the average will go up over time, and the last sentence doesn't kick in. But if instead it creates a collusion of a race to the bottom, um, which I think is the other potential policy outcome here, then um, the superintendent has the authority to step in and do rulemaking um, to determine where that floor should be set. And we'll have all this data at that point that he can use to, or she, um, could use to set, <laughs> it'll be a new superintendent, um, could use to set um, what that floor would be um, through an APA rulemaking process, right? So, so when you ask, you know, what would the rule, what would the floor be? Would it be the average? Would it be, you know, one standard deviation less the average? What would it be? That would be determined through the rulemaking process with, you know, the appropriate input from stakeholders and whatnot that can be afforded um, as part of that regular administrative procedures process. So that seemed like such a really great way of arriving at that same value to main consumers, but in a way that wasn't going to shock the market, wasn't going to set the um, floor at the wrong level, um, but that still gave the superintendent those that tool should they need it. And, and actually, I think it's really good. I think that it really... Um, gets us to the right spot. So, so that's kind of what, where that second or that last part of section seven came from. If I could just follow up real quick, I, I agree with um, what you said. I think that, that the way you've laid it out makes a lot of sense. My only question, as much as I hate seeing on the calendar that when we have major substantive rule hearings, because they, they can get pretty boring and technical, I just wonder on something like that, that's a potential policy implication, if the legis if it, they shouldn't come back to the committee um, for our review on something like that, only because you know, my concern with the original bill was sort of what you laid out. It's it's us determining what that value is and what that value should be. I can appreciate what you said as far as, um, you know, if it if it starts off at like we we look at it and it's like seventy percent, and then it starts to dip down, wanting to to regulate that and wanting to have a a rule set. And I think I'm glad we're having this discussion. I just still would have concerns about one person making that decision without coming before the committee um, to to at least present their thoughts. Is that's that's my only thought, and perhaps changing it to me, having it be a major substantive um, versus routine technical because of the potential uh, impact on consumers. Um, Representative Morris, I guess I would intervene here and say that routine technical rules are also subject to a fairly rigorous process. Oh, we're yes. Not, we're just not part of that. That doesn't mean that stakeholders can't be part of that process. I, yes, I, I understand that. I, my thought is, though, that we are the ones that are actually elected by the people, and that's why you know, because they can go and make their case to the um, to the bureau, and 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 then if then the bureau can still rule whatever whatever they want, regardless of what other people are going to weigh in on. Whereas if they have to come to us, we're the final arbiter of that. That's why. That's why I think in this case, I'm just wondering if it might make sense to make this particular rule be a major substantive because 
then it's that final piece on the policy asking us to um, asking us to put the final, you know, and it may be something where when we see all this data, because as, as Senator Sanborn just laid it out, if I saw that data and they could say, I would, I would probably agree with having with, with the major substantive rule, but I still think we should weigh in because we have seen at times um, departments go a little awry with some of their rulemaking and some of the routine technical rules. And I would feel more comfortable knowing that the legislature is going to be the final arbiters. Okay, Senator Sanborn, do you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would really be much more comfortable with keeping this as routine technical. Um, there's going to be a lot of rulemaking potentially related to this. Um, there's some market segment def definitions. There's some um, credibility of coverage definitions and so forth. I, I think that the, um, the possibility of moving to a minimum um, loss ratio floor and setting that by rule it's a contingent possibility even at this point. Um, and the legislature always has the final say because Representative Morris, you could bring a bill and overturn that rule. And it's just as easy to do that. It might even be easier <laughs> to do that um, as a standalone bill. It's still not easy, but it's you know much easier to do than to get rid of a substantive rule I think um, it's very confusing how you overturn a substantive rule under our rules um, in the main legislature. And so I think this is a situation where if there was a legislator who thought that the superintendent had gone too far and that the data didn't support the rule, that an, a standalone bill would be an appropriate way to go. Um, and if they really were out on a limb, I think that that bill would be successful. Um, but I think that instead there's so much groundwork that has to be laid to even trigger that type of rulemaking here that I think that's enough of a, a protection in this circumstance. And I guess the other thing I would just say about that is that because of the, the way that the cadence of the legislative season works and then pairing that into the insurance plan year and reporting deadlines, they don't mix very well. And so I worry that um, it would prevent this, the superintendent from taking action in the same plan year that things got bad, um, for example. Um, and that's, I don't want there to be a delay while the legislature has to approve a substantive rule. Um, and that can be an issue. So I, I would respectfully hope that I could convince you to uh, come along with this as a routine technical. And I just will also notice that, note that I don't think there's anybody from industry asking this to be a substantive rule as well. I'll just- go, um, go ahead, Representative. Yeah, Will. no, I, I, yeah, I don't want the whole thing that you're right. There are a lot of rules in this. Um, there are a lot of rules in this, you're right. And I don't want every single one of those rules. It's just that if there's a final, I just was curious if as to why we went with routine technical versus major substantive. I have certainly, it's it's certainly also my pref, it's, it's my thought process is again, it's just, we have a job to do as legislators. It's not about um, anybody, you're right, no one else, this was developed uh, with all stakeholders in place and certainly with the routine technical uh, being in it. So we don't, you know, we don't need to sit here and debate it all day. I just, it was just my thought to ask the question as to whether or not it should be uh, a, root, uh, a major substantive just on that basis. Um, but you're right. I, I think, you know, it is confusing the way we sometimes do major substantive rules because it's confusing that if we don't adopt the rule, then they can go ahead and adopt the rule sometimes. And sometimes it may be better to just, uh, if it gets to that point, put in other legislation to address the issue at that time. I, I, I will say um, you're right with uh, the superintendent leaving. We don't know who's coming in next. Um, and uh, 
we just you know i want to i just want to make sure that how this is laid out is exactly how we're intending it and it doesn't become something where rulemaking takes it in a direction other than what the committee um to get a unanimous report is trying to do it was my only point um i just i'm i'm always concerned um when sometimes we pass laws and then things get interpreted in a way other than what we are intending i think what you're intending here is very good we want to have more transparency with the process uh, make sure that I think that consumers have a right to know how their dental, when they pay for their dental insurance, what they're paying for and what the loss ratio is. And I think anything we can do to bring sunlight on that is obviously a good thing. I just question whether or not um, how, how we should, how it should go forward when it gets to that point. Um, you're right. There's not a lot of opposition to it from outside i just as a legislator think sometimes we need to make sure we weigh in but um if that's not the feeling of the committee as a whole that's that's fine representative morris i'm going to turn to another committee member in a moment but would you like to have someone from the bureau come in to uh make a comment on the issue around routine technical rules is that a yes? I'm confused. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. So, uh, before we pull in a, a person from the Bureau to discuss that, I will turn to Representative Brooks. And the other thing I would like to do is give uh, Representative Evans, who has rejoined us, an opportunity to vote but um, on the previous bill on LD 794. But go ahead, Representative Brooks, if you can keep your question condensed, uh, then we can get to Representative Evans. I'll keep it very condensed. I'm, I'm all set for now, thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Representative Brooks. And um, uh, Ms. Kayford, are you there? Can you um, poll Representative Evans on LD 794? Yes. It was a motion to, uh, to pass as amended. Uh, uh, my vote would be yes. Representative Evans, yes. Thank you. Thank well, you. Nice. Thank you. And um, can we have Mr. Yardley join us, please, um, to discuss the issue of routine technical versus major substantive rules um, as, it, as it figures in the part of this bill that addresses setting a floor for um, for dental loss ratio. Just waiting for Mr. Yardley to come all the way through the wormhole. I think we can hear you, Mr. Yardley, but we can't see you yet. If you'd like to just go ahead and speak without turning on your camera, that's fine. Oh, this is, oh. Yes, we can hear you. Oops. Ah, oh, there he is. I'm sorry, I, I didn't see that the um, program wanted me to click a button. Um, so um, I, I, my name is Ben Yardley. Um, I am the senior attorney at the Bureau of Insurance. Um, with respect to um, uh, routine technical rulemaking, I can tell you that um, I think on a good rule, uh, one in which all the stars align. Uh, we're talking um, four, four months at a minimum to get everything done. Um, in the time since um, 
uh, July of 2018, when I um, became senior attorney, we have um, not done um, uh, major substantive rulemaking, um, so I don't have firsthand experience with this. Um, but um, I can tell you that the process is, is much longer and um, it does involve having um, uh, the legislature uh, uh, come back into session and well, that, that, that the, the agency's work would be taken up um, when the um, uh, legislature is next in session. Um, and this, this could um, delay um, uh, the Bureau's ability to be um, as responsive as um, perhaps we might want to be um, in the case of a, a relatively quickly developing market. Um, and um, I would also, uh, Representative Tepler um, did comment that um, the um, uh, routine technical process is subject to plenty of safeguards. Uh, there's a, a um, notice requirement um, and a comment period. And then um, if comments um, are received from uh, interested parties or the public generally, um, the agency's required to um, write a, um, a basis statement um, and summary of comments that uh, addresses the, the comments in our rationale um, for, um, uh, uh, for handling them. Um, and I think there's also a, a court review process, uh, which um, I'm not um, personally familiar with either. I hope that's responsive to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Yardley. Representative Morris, do you want to ask anything further or have any uh, questions for Mr. Yardley regarding this bill? Well, yeah, no, I, I just, in terms of, uh, I assume you've seen the draft. I'm just curious as to how that um, is going to, how something like in, in this specific bill is going to uh, play out, what the process would be by which you develop, you decide to develop a rule on this specific, uh, with this specific bill as it relates to the loss ratios. And obviously the rest of it, I think is pretty much, uh, is very transparent. It's, it's pretty objective. That's the part that's potentially subjective. So I'm just curious how, how the Bureau would go about making a decision like on, on an issue such as that. So the statutory, thank you for the question, um, Representative Morris, the, the, the proposed statutory map is um, a decline in the dental loss ratio in a market segment. Um, then we would identify dental plans that fall outside of, of one standard deviation um, or um, establish um, uh, by rule, uh, minimum loss, uh, dental loss ratio. Um, and um, I believe um, there is um, a, um, there's an NAIC model for guidelines that I think we would look at. Um, and, it, you know, it's hard to, uh, I think the best I can say is that we would be thorough. Um, yeah. And the specific um, circumstances would, you know, we would look at them and, and evaluate them carefully. Um, I'm not sure if I've satisfactorily answered your question, but I hope I've given you some reassurance. It's it's largely a hypothetical question, so it's hard to give it you know, a real direct <laughs> answer. I get it. I, I didn't I'm want just, to, no, didn't I'm want just to trying accuse to get an you understanding of, of uh, how. I was trying to get an understanding of how the whole process works um, from the, uh, you know, my, I, I will, you know, like I said, my biggest concern with the original bill was having us decide what value is um, because it's, it's, 
for each individual consumer um, to determine whether or not they feel like there's value in what they're purchasing. Um, I also understand the idea that uh, we want to make sure that, you know, that a dental plan or any, any insurance policy is not just taking in premiums and then not paying benefits. So I appreciate the safeguards uh, as well. I just want to make sure that before we set uh, a number, that before a number gets set, that um, we're not, my concern, again, with that original policy of 80% was if it meant people could no longer get a $30 dental policy, and then they just dropped their dental insurance um, altogether, I don't think that that's that's a win, but I want to, so I want to make sure that obviously if I was concerned about the legislature doing that, I wouldn't want a, the Bureau to do it either to be in a situation where they're determining value, where the consumer may not have an issue with the value of the product itself. And I, so I guess kind of, I, I guess kind of, does the Bureau also track complaints by company and, and all of that when they're tracking, you know, cause I think a lot of this, is dealt with when people complain about a um, have issues with their dental policy or with their insurer not maybe paying the benefits they thought they were promised. Um, so complaints are. Track- I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Representative. That's okay. I I, I think um, I uh, can. Representative Morris may be missing the part of this that depends on a mathematical analysis. Right. It shows that there's a market trend of declining um, dental loss ratios. So we start with that. We've got yep. declining overall dental loss ratios. And then right. we have a choice between describing the outliers there, if oh. they're outliers, or set, potentially setting a minimum okay dental loss so let, let me just let me just i i think i understand what you're saying because you may be right i may be missing the point <laughs> i often do um but the um so what you're saying is the way we're looking at this is if there is say it's a situation of somebody of you, you do you look at a marketplace and it's in the the medical the dental loss ratio is say 70 percent and then over time it declines to say 67 percent you want to look and see is it is it is it an overall market issue where everyone's declining or is it because of one outlier that's causing it to decline is what you're saying and then in that case that they would make the determination so the the prerequisite is for a market segment to be declining. And, and then, um, then we have the ability either to identify the um, outliers and or we establish by rule a minimum okay. loss ratio. So, but so another- under the next under the next subsection, um, for the if we identify the outliers, then we um, conduct a review and we look for relevant financial information as requested. And then we could um, ask for a remediation plan, all with the goal of trying to bring the market back together. Okay, so- so Representative Morris, what I think we're saying is that none of this is based on individual consumer complaint. No. It's totally based on a mathematical analysis of the market. Yeah. Nope, I I understand that. I think I I don't know where I was chasing that rabbit hole, but I appreciate you indulging me. <laughs> okay. I, I'm good now, so I appreciate you. I appreciate you bringing the superintendent. And, 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 and it's, it's it's an appropriate way to do it because we very very rarely get complaints about dental. No, I I I figured you did. I just. And like I said, I do appreciate the, the approach that Senator Sanborn took with this. I just was curious on the routine technical versus the um, versus the major substantive. And I, I think now, based on your explanation and, and 
I have a better understanding of where we're trying to go with this and I'm comfortable with, uh, with it as written, so. Thank you, Representative Morris. And Representative Brooks, is your question for um, Mr. Yardley or is it more gentle? No, it's not for Mr. Yardley. So thank you for your help, Mr. Yardley. Oh, Senator Sanborn, is your question for Mr. Yardley? Oh, okay, before we send Mr. Yardley back to the attendee, we're gonna have Senator Sanborn ask him a question. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, Mr. Yardley, there's a, a, a word that's used um, in the first part of the definitions um, under numbers under letter C that says on a plan providing dental care services determined by the superintendent to be non-credible. And I was wondering if you could help us understand what that is supposed to mean. I think I know, but I'm not 100% sure that I do know. So, so I, um, we're verging perilously close to um, actuarial speak, um, <laughs> but um, I will um, offer that I think it's a plan that does not have enough members in it to um, give you reliable, uh, give you enough information to make a, a sober conclusion about um, the, the plan's um, operations. Yeah. That, if if that Ms. Was... Hooper thinks I'm wrong, I'm, she has a hand she can raise. <laughs> That was my understanding too, was that it was sort of a term of art uh, in this realm, but I had some questions from other stakeholders about what it meant. So I thought it'd be helpful to know that it was, it was a thing insurance people talk about <laughs> as a term of art. Ms. We, Hooper hasn't raised her hand. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking that Mr. Yardley got it right. Um, and uh Thank you um, very much for joining us, Mr. Yardley. We appreciate the information you gave. Um, and I will now turn to the very patient Representative Brooks. I, has... I had another question for Mr. Yardley, oh, if he didn't oh, mind. Sorry, Representative Brooks. Hang on one more minute. Well, Senator Sanborn asked Mr. Yardley another question. So the other question, Mr. Yardley, is about the unallocated language at the end that talks about the applicability of the um, uh, of the provision um, and that it applies to um, contracts that are issued in the state of Maine. Um, and so it says um, for purposes of this act uh let's see the, the requirements of this act do not apply to individual or group dental plans when the contract is issued outside of this state and so i was hoping that you could speak to to where a contract is issued um a little bit um i i discussed this a bit with the insurers and and was concerned about venue shopping and they assured me that it wasn't an issue um, because if your corporate headquarters are located in Maine, you can't just buy a dental insurance plan and have the contract be issued in New Hampshire or some other state just because you like their insurance regulations better. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so um, the um, for the entity that is located in Maine, it would need to have a Maine issued plan. And I, I think um, the, uh, this would be directed at um, an, uh, an employer that has um, incidental operations in Maine, but its um, primary business is elsewhere. Okay. That, that's what I understood it to mean as well, and that that made sense that we wouldn't try and collect data on that sort of a plan. And then just if I could ask a question, um, we had some conversation with um, Ms. Robinson and about the draft and offered her a couple of comments. Um, I don't know whether those have been shared with the, community, with the committee and whether you want to hear that at this point, I can... I'm happy to do it, however, the committee's, uh, whatever the committee's preference is. Um, I think we did get a copy of Ms. Robinson's comments. No, we didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we did get that 
in an email from Edna. I thought I saw it. I think we've gotten some comments from Ms. Robinson, but I don't know what the Bureau gave for specific changes to the language. I, I think I know, but not directly. So it'd be helpful if we could get walked through those specific edits to the language. Okay, before we do that though, let's let Representative Brooke present her question that she's been waiting a while to present. Go ahead. So I was gonna say, um, I'm ready to make a motion, but I don't wanna stop, stop debate. Um, I can make a motion. There are people in the audience uh, I, I want to thank the Bureau, first and foremost, for addressing the issue um, that we have. Um, so I don't know if it's appropriate to make a motion or to ask a question. I see um, Kate Endy in the, in the uh, attendee room to help address the need. So it's, a, it's kind of a separate question. Uh, Marty Hooper is here. The report is very good. So um, I'll ask, I'll ask Marty. I don't have a question for Mr. Yardley specifically. Okay. So... You, you would like to make a motion um, and to uh, accept the report as ought to pass as amended. It, okay, it's not the report, the bill. You're making it the bill. The bill, yeah, not the report. The bill okay. ought to pass are, as amended. Are we ready in terms of language on this? Do we feel like we're at a place where we could accept a motion ought to pass as amended? I'd really like to hear the superintendents. I mean, Mr. Yardley's comments about what the BOI's feedback on the language is. Okay, so before we um, proceed um, to take a second on your motion, Representative Brooks will we'll, um, hear Mr. Yardley talk about um, the, Ms. Robinson's comments on the language. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Representative Tepler and, and Senator Sanborn. Um, we only have two comments um, and um, I, I can tell you that um, Ms. Robinson uh, told me that they don't have any concerns with them. Um, so um, at paragraph in the middle of um, page two, paragraph six, dental loss ratio reporting, Subparagraph um, B um, it reads, if verification of information contained in a report under this subsection is necessary, the superintendent shall provide at least 30 days prior notice to the carrier providing the dental plan before commencing any examination of, the, of that carrier and the carrier has 30 days, et cetera. We would propose deleting from the comma that follows the word necessary at the first, near the end of the first line, through the word, through the phrase examination of that carrier on the third line, so that the paragraph B would read, if verification of information contained in the report under this section, subsection is necessary the carrier has 30 days to submit any information required by the superintendent. Um, we feel that this um, is um, consistent with the provision in section 220 sub two, which says that anyone required to be licensed um, has to respond within 30 days of receiving an inquiry from the superintendent. There's no, no warning period given. Um, and the second change we would ask for is under um, paragraph eight, going over to the um, top first line of the third page, the phrase upon a comp uh, comprehensive review of the dental plan the superintendent may require. Um, we're not sure what a comprehensive review of the dental plan meant. Um, it sounds like a comprehensive exam, which could be market conduct or financial exam. So we would just recommend deleting that phrase and saying that so the sentence would just read the superintendent may require the carrier, et cetera. Ms. McCarthy Reed, did you get that? Thank you. Okay. And um, Senator Sanborn, go ahead. 
I really like those two changes. And I thank Mr. Yardley for working with uh, the insurance folks um, to make sure they were okay with them before the, uh, before the hearing as well, before this meeting. So I hope they will be incorporated into what the committee reports. Okay, so um, Representative Brooks, are you ready now to make your motion? I'll to uh, pass as amended by the uh, Bureau. Okay. So we'll see those changes at language review. I believe that Representative Evans just seconded that motion. Um, is the committee ready for the vote? Okay, um, Ms. Caford, will you call the roll? Yes, thank you. Senator Sanborn? Yes. Senator Sanborn? Yes. Senator Brenner? Yes. Senator Brenner? Yes. Senator Stewart? Representative Tepler? Yes. Representative Tepler? Yes. Representative Arford? Yes. Representative Arford? Yes. Representative Blyer? Yes. Representative Blyer? Yes. Representative Brooks? Yes. Representative Brooks? Yes. Representative Connor? Yes. Representative Connor? Yes. Representative Evans? Yes. Representative Evans? Yes. Representative Matheson? Yes. Representative Matheson? Yes. Representative Malarango? Yes. Representative Malarango? Yes. Representative Morris? Yes. Representative Morris, yes. Representative Quinn. 11 members of the committee have voted in the affirmative and zero in the negative. Thank you very much, Ms. Kayford. So unanimous of those present and voting. Um, absent members, again, have the ability to register their vote through the presiding officers. Um, I believe this brings our work for the day to an end. Um, we will see everyone in person tomorrow. And um, on Thursday, we will have morning public hearings and afternoon work sessions with, I think, some language review as well. I'm hopeful I'll have some fiscal reviews back for you so you can do some language review. Um, okay. I'll also have the two bills you voted today without language, without fiscal, but I can bring them back um, uh, Thursday. Great, thank you. Well, good work everyone. And uh, once more, unanimity from HCIFS. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm glad I, I made you work for it a little bit today, but. <laughs> that, that's okay, Representative Morris. Uh, any, anything that enables us to make you comfortable so we can get there. That I appreciate. I appreciate the indulgence. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you, colleagues.